recording. Okay, Mr. Marshall, you should be good to go. Okay, thank you, Ms. Field Sadler. <laughs> Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of January 19th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this planning board meeting including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town's website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted, However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Jack Jemsek. Here. Tom Long. Present. Uh, Andrew McDougall. Andrew? Okay, it doesn't sound like he has the video operational yet. Uh, I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan? I'm present with my dog, sorry. And Johanna Newman? Present. Thank you. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to mute, remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment could also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, before going further, I'd like to check on Andrew uh, McDougall. Is he? Andrew has, um... Uh, audio issues. He's rebooting his computer, and okay. um, he said he'll speak up when he can hear everybody. And I suggested that he join by phone if nothing else works. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. All right. Item one on the uh, agenda this evening are minutes approval for minutes. Uh, the first minutes to be approved are from March thirty first of last year, catching up on our backlog. Uh, thanks, Chris and Pam, for uh, getting these caught up. Uh, does anybody uh, who has any, does anybody have any comments on the March thirty first minutes? All right. Um, 
Looks like Andrew's trying to connect again. I'm in. You're in and we can hear you. Okay, so it's now 638 and Andrew has arrived. So we are fully present for this meeting. Um, so Andrew, I was just at the point of the first set of minutes, March 31st of last year. Uh, no one else had any comments. Do you have any comments? I do not. Okay, then we'll go right into a vote. Um, may I have a motion to approve the March 31st minutes as uh, written by, by Chris? Uh, Jack. All right, how about Johanna? I move, <clears throat> excuse me, I move to approve the minutes from March 31st as written. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, do we have a second? Andrew. I'll second. Thank you. All right. No more, no, no, no comments yet. So we'll go right through with the roll call. Maria. Uh, approve. Uh, Jack. Approve. Tom. Approve. Andrew. Approve. I'm an approve. Janet. Approve. Uh, Johanna. Approve. All right. Uh, the second set of minutes are from April 14th of last year. Um, are there any comments on those minutes? All right. Uh, why don't I make the motion to approve those minutes? Tom, you want a second? I'll second. Thank you. And no uh, comments yet. So we'll go in reverse order. Johanna? Approve. Uh, Janet? Approve. Uh, I'm an approve. Andrew? Approve. Tom? Approve. Jack? Approve. And Maria? Approve. All right, thank you all. The last of the three sets of minutes for this evening is from our last meeting, January 5th of 2022. Um, why don't we start with just a motion and then I'll ask if there's any comments. Anybody want to approve, mo make a motion? Uh, Janet, I saw your hand first. <laughs> I move to approve the minutes of January 5th. Are we on? Yep. 2022. Thank you. Andrew? I'll second the motion. All right, thank you. Any comments by anyone on the board? Andrew? I will just say that I, I really liked the detail of the public comment. Just, I've heard some of these names and it was really nice having that recap, especially since I was late. So thank you for uh, putting that in. All right, good. Okay, this time we'll start, let's, let's start with Tom. This is a approved approve to, to, to approve these minutes. Um, Andrew? Approve. Uh, Janet? Approve. Johanna? Approve. Maria? Approve. Jack? Approve. And I'm an approve. All right. So that was item one on our agenda this evening. Um, next, we will go into the public comment period. I see that there are 15 members of the public uh, who are tuned in. So at this time, we'll take comments on items which are not on the agenda for this evening. So that would encompass uh, the, the public hearings that are related to Wagner Wood and Amherst College. Um, we also have later in, on our agenda con more conversation about the solar bylaw, hope, assuming we get there. And so are there any comments about topics other than those comments, than those topics I've just named? All right, I don't see any public comment. And the time is 6.43 for the record.
All right, the next item on our agenda this evening uh, is a public hearing. And the time is 643. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding Site Plan Review 2022-07 from James and Joseph Wagner of Wagner Wood at 305 Northeast Street. <clears throat> Request Site Plan Review approval under Section 3.312 of the Zoning Bylaw to construct a two-story addition to the westerly side of an existing barn for use as a class one farm stand, including office space for the agricultural uses existing on the premises and associated site improvements. Uh, concerns map 12A parcel 15 in the RN and RLD slash FC zoning district. All right, so first, are there any board member disclosures? I do not see any. And we'll go right into the applicant presentation. I assume that's why Tom Reedy has appeared as a, as a, as a panelist. So Chris, unless you have a comment to introduce this, we can go right to Tom. Go right to Tom. Thank you. Thank Hello, you very Tom. much, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'm Tom Reedy, I'm an attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of the Wagners and their application for site plan approval for a farm stand um, at their property on Northeast Street. With me this evening, Barry Roberts, who's working with the Wagners on this project. So if you've got any questions, both uh, Barry and I uh, would happily answer them. So for those of you who are at the site visit and, and maybe what I'll do is share a screen if, if that works and if everybody can see. I've highlighted the property in yellow. This is the Northeast Street property. Strong Street is the cross street up here. Um, if you kept going southerly, you'd come to the, the intersection of, uh, I think it's Main and maybe Pelham Road. Um, so this is, this is the property that we're talking about here. As I will show you in a little bit, the this does not exist anymore. For those of you who are at the site visit, it's a concrete foundation only, but this is about the area where um, the farm stand addition is proposed to be. So this is for those of you who are familiar with the site, you know, access is off of Northeast Street, uh, not looking to change really anything in here. As you'll see, we'll have some parking over here. The ADA parking will be here. We'll have some parking over here for the residents and the store. We'll have some parking over here. And this is a little bit of a dated photograph. So those board members who were at the site visit uh, know that this is not happening on site right now. There is the ability to park in, in, the, in the proposed conditions. There will be the ability to park in this area. Um, and then as you'll see, there will be, there's a little bump out to what is being proposed. And so I'll probably switch if you can still see what I was talking about. Existing house here, it's the milling surface, Northeast Street on the left side, west side as it were. Here you've got store parking um, with signage and you have the, the ADA van access accessible route to, here's where the main entrance would be to the farm stand. If you'll recall, that's about the footprint of where that existing structure was, less that bump out, which the existing structure isn't there right now, except for the, the foundation, that's all gonna be taken out. And this structure with a basement is going to be put in. Um, as we had talked about at the site visit, the existing barn is staying. It's a hay storage with a full basement under it where, where the cows are. And so we would just have an exterior wall, the existing exterior wall of the barn, up against an existing exterior wall of the new structure. So they would just be butted up against each other. Um, we're proposing some stairs over here to access and you'll see the floor plan uh, momentarily and you'll, you'll see where that access is. Ultimately, there'll be 
to look under the roof. Uh, there's a loft on the second floor for storage. On the first floor, there'll be some offices here, uh, an open hallway, and then the farm stand will be in this area here. So that's why that main entrance uh, that will be at grade will be in this area here. There will be lights over the entries. I'll, I'll show you a, a photograph actually of what those lights will look like uh, and along with that porch light right there. There are motion sensor lights. So if you were out there yesterday at the site visit, you saw that there's, boy, it looks like at least three motion sensors uh, high enough on the back of the residence pointing out into the parking lot. And there's an existing light over here. It's uh, like one of those Wamiko lights, the somewhat gooseneck that you would see as a street light that goes on from dusk to dawn. There are five parking spaces um, proposed for this westerly side of the parking area, four parking spaces proposed for this northerly side of the parking area. Um, the, the store would be open uh, essentially from dawn to dusk, except you know probably during the winter, they'd wanna stay open a little bit longer than dusk because dusk is so early during the winter as we're all experiencing right now. Um, so I don't know if we want to put a time on it. You know, I think they'd want the maximum flexibility to be open from as early as they can to as late as they can with the condition that they provide adequate sight lighting when uh, it is dark, you know, when it's, it's getting dark and it's dark. So these lights would propose to be on from dusk until closing. Same thing with this one. And, and these motion lights are obviously motion censored. Um, if you can see, this is what that fixture will look like. And, and Chris and Pam, I can send this over to you. We hadn't submitted this yet, but this is really what that fixture, downcast, dark sky compliant, um, quaint, and we think effective for the, for the use. Let me get to... So here's the floor plan. Existing barn here. If you were at the site visit, you saw those barn doors. And so there's a question about, well, where, where is this going to start? And so it starts, there was a window on the barn. It'll start just to the right of that window or to the left of these barn doors. Uh, they still utilize this barn. And so they would need to have access and be able to open those barn doors. The footprint, if you'll remember that L shape, you've got that entrance that we talked about here um, that will be at grade, so it'll be accessible. You've got the retail area here. You've got the coolers along this northerly side, the left side in the plan. You've got your checkout area here. Stairs not accessible to the public because there's no public spaces. There's no public bathroom. Um, so really the public is only gonna have access to this area right in here. There's that porch, if you recall, you saw those steps uh, with that porch light. There's the porch, there's a doorway into this open area with the hallway. And then you've got three offices, 100 square feet each. Uh, to be used for the existing agricultural uses on the property. So Wagner Wood obviously operates at this site. Um, they also have um, an office in their house. They'd like to keep that office. They have, uh, Buzzy and Jamie have five kids. So what I had said yesterday is, you know, it's important for, you know, Jamie to be able to watch the kids in the house and probably also to get away from the kids. So they'd like to maintain that same office in the house and also utilize these offices. They, they would be to complement the farm um, stand and also for just the agricultural uses on site. Here's just a elevation of what that building would look like. So again, you've got the existing barn. If you're following, you've got the, the doors here. Here's that entrance. The sign that we would be proposing is no greater than four square feet. And I'll, I'll flip back to the other page to show you where the other sign uh, being proposed is up along the road. And so we've got that downcast lighting, you've got the windows, we've got vertical planks, I'll call them, which if you saw the barn, you, they also have vertical planks. I don't know, there might be eight inches or more. And Barry, if, if I'm way off, let me know. But vertical planks and, and the Wagners would be looking to use native lumber, lumber that they actually saw at their mill on site for uh, this property here. Uh, you'll see the porch, 
you see, um, you know, the, the loft area, that second floor, which again is just going to be for storage. So this is just a second floor. It's, it's open above. So it'll appear as a two story um, open space. You know, when you're walking to the farm stand, you'll have the roof uh, two stories above. And then that loft is over where the, uh, the offices are. This is looking from the northerly side. It's not shown, but there is that porch right over here. You see that the grade slopes off. Ultimately, uh, what we'll have is there'll be an access into the basement because that's where the Wagners are gonna store their freezers. And so I probably should say, cause it's most important, all of, at least at this time. So I'll say we'll comply with the bylaw. And so we'd, we'd accept the condition that we comply with the language of the bylaw as it's written. The intent is to have 100% of the products from on site. So they raise cattle. And so the idea would be to send that cattle out and then to bring the, the cattle byproduct, the meat back um, for sale at the farm stand. They, they'd like the ability in the future, maybe to get you know complementary produce that's not grown on site, but is from Massachusetts. So they'll comply with the bylaw, just so you know that the intent right now is to just sell the wares from uh, the farm at, at the site. Oh, there you go. There's the north elevation with that porch, which is um, the right way to look at it. And then you've got that south elevation. This is uh, the existing barn. Here's that other side of that entry, if you'll recall. Um, and it's, it's a two-story in appearance from that side. And then just to go back, the wood sign, Wagner's Farms. Uh, farm stand right here, uh, four by two. So eight square feet is what this would be. And it's proposed to be right here. We're also uh, thinking about putting a safety sign, you know, um, caution pedestrian traffic in about this area. We're happy to update the plans. Um, and then I guess if, if that's deemed as exceeding the square footage for the signage, I, I'm not sure that safety signs are like traffic or informational signs are. I'd have to frankly look into the, in the bylaw. Um, assuming it is, uh, then we'd request a waiver from Article 8 for the ability to put in that additional safety sign. If it's not, then we'd just like to put in that safety sign. Uh, there are trucks that travel you know, through this path. Um, most of them are, are Wagner's trucks, um, or they're folks who come here often to pick up the mulch to um, or to drop off other tree products. So. A lot of the times it's, it's people who know. Um, and so they'll certainly let you know, people who are coming know and let their drivers know there could be pedestrian traffic. And so the route is really, it's coming in and looping around. Not often do, you, do they use this southerly access here. So you know, we thought um, that a signage here, just alerting um, motoring public to pedestrians was the, was the wise thing to do. So that's, it's not shown on the plan, but that's what we would be proposing. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or linger on any of these um, plans, but that's uh, that's what we've got right now. All right, thank you, Tom. Sure. Um, does anybody have any questions for Tom off the bat? All right. Johanna, is that you? I'm no? here, but I'm not doing okay. anything. All right, Just fine. Oh, okay, here's, here's the hands. Um, Andrew. Mine's real quick. Um, Tom, thanks for the presentation. Good seeing you yesterday. Um, oh, I'm, I'm, I, I forgot, should we go into the site, uh, the site visit report first? Sure. Um, so I don't know who was, who was there, um, but if someone that was at the site yesterday could volunteer to give us a little report, Andrew, you still have your hand up. Yeah, that's fine. I, I can, I can do the report. Um, so I was there along with, uh, Johanna and Janet and Chris, uh, we met with Tom and, uh, Buzzy Wagner, um, and Barry Roberts. Um, we were, um, able to see the site. It's currently, as was explained, uh, an existing solid concrete foundation that's going to be demolished. Um, 
we got a general sense of the overall, that's yeah, probably a better look. So we saw essentially where that roof line is now, that's existing concrete. Uh, we parked around where that red truck was. So uh, agree with what Tom mentioned in his introduction that in its current configuration, that's a logical spot for people to park. It's where we all did. Um, we um, had some questions which were related to traffic flow. So uh, we asked about how the large vehicles and trucks get through, who drives those trucks and, and some general safety questions, which uh, Tom alluded to in his presentation um, that you know the, the truck deliveries are generally aware of the situation given the fact that Buzzy and his family has five kids, traffic moves through slowly, but they had acknowledged that uh, it would be useful to put up a sign as, as Tom already alluded to. Um, we did have some questions relative to ADA access. So the material, it's, uh, I can't remember what we decided to call it, uh, the existing kind of paved material, um, whether or not that was going to be changed. Uh, it was shared with us that the, the surface would remain as it is. Um, it's generally flat. The, the, the distance line from the, the ADA spot to the front entrance is, is generally level, as you saw in some of the elevation views, uh, as you wrap around the north of the building, the elevation does drop, but um, they have acknowledged the need for ADA parking. We'll have a designated spot and also indicated that given the, the nature of the area, it's quite possible that somebody who has difficulty um, moving around might just park close to the building anyway, uh, so that they could get quick access to it. Um, the lights on the, the house were pointed out and um, the motion center lights. And then there was also the, the indication that there will be some lights that are also, uh, yeah, that post that Tom just pointed to. And then also that there would be the coach lights on the side of the building as well. Uh, there is a couple existing, there's I think actually one existing temporary structure that's moved around that's in kind of the shadow line of the barn there now. but um, I think that was about it. Um, Janet, Johanna, anything that I may have missed? All right. So um, if I could if I could ask my question real quick, Doug? Sure, go right ahead and into it. Thanks, which is um, the one thing that I wasn't sure about was was a lighting plan. I, I believe you'd mentioned that you, you know you'd have something a bit more formal. It's just those spotlights. Um, how far, what is the distance from those lights to the front door? And is that, that seems like that will be kind of the, the primary lighting for the, for the parking area at this point? So it looks like here, it's a little less than 60 feet from those, those motion sensors. Um, you know, I think it's, it's one of those things where, and, and if you wanna put a condition on it that there's adequate site lighting and then we can just review it to make sure that you know, once this thing gets built, we can turn, come out there at night, take a look, turn the porch lights on. Let's see what these motion lights do. If we have to install new ones, because you know, there's some really bright ones that you can get. Uh, it's not gonna, the Wagner's own this property as well. So, and everything's facing back into here. So you're really, you're not gonna have any light trespass. They're gonna be downcast, but you know, they will travel a certain way. So, um, you know, we can certainly make sure that, that it is adequate. Um, but we didn't, frankly, we didn't go through and have a photo project like this. We're not really going to do a photometric plan. Um, yep. so yeah, I mean, I think we, we think they're okay. Um, but if they're not, then we certainly will upgrade and we don't, you know, safety is a priority here. Yeah. And I was, I was the area that I just wasn't really positive about was, you know, sort of the parking component here, right. Is whether that the people as they park there, whether they're getting lighting as they travel all the way around yeah okay so yeah happy to hear that you will address that 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 was i think yep. the only question that i had okay thanks andrew uh janet um so i i the site visit was really helpful to understand how things how cars would move and where things were um, and I think it's exciting that they're, you know, opening the farm stand and there's more local food and local beef. And um, I've noticed there's more local cows on that site in the last like five years or so. So um, it seems like a great thing to me. Um, I did 
I did have a question or a, a concern about the ADA spot because it seemed to me that it should there should be spots like one or two spots closer to the entrance way. Um, and in the surface did seem very, um, I was concerned about the surface, but it does seem incredibly pounded to flatness and it doesn't, it doesn't get um, muddy. But I, I felt like it should be much closer to the store and that going, if you were had some mobility issues or visual issues going across maybe um, to that store, there, there, there should be a parking space closer because there's trucks coming and other cars coming back and forth. And I just wondered um, if the sheds could be moved and maybe a space or two made, you know, next to the barn so someone could just drive up there, you know, walk 10 feet and get into the store and do their business without, you know, risk or, you know, struggling to get across and things like that. So that was my major concern was just ADA access. And I, it's going to be my concern on the next, pro the next project too. But I would love to see some parking much closer to the building that someone's not going across a lane with a large truck or cars moving. Um, and most, you know, most times we have parking right as, as close as you can get. Um, yeah, and you know, it, it might make sense for us to put up a, a space right here in, in front. We can look at the space over here. The only issue is, so there's a, uh, a basement underneath this barn. Uh -huh. And so there's a certain grade from the entrance to these doors back down to this parking area, this traveled area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. because underneath it is the cellar where the cows are. And so we just want to be mindful of maintaining the appropriate grade for accessibility purposes. So I don't know that, you know, something over here would work just because I think it's probably a, like maybe minutely, but maybe a little too steep. So we, we'll look at something right here because this is probably all along the same grade. Yeah. Um, so I think we'd look to put something like, you know, a, a, a space right here probably to me makes the most sense given everything just just the site itself yeah so that would be a condition i would support just having a space very close either okay. next to the building or maybe where the sheds were i forget about the slope i didn't i forgot about that and then you know they have to get into the barn yeah yeah but that's an acceptable condition we talked about that yesterday and that's mm -hmm. the wagons are fine with that All right. I, have a quick, I have a quick question is there's a light on the building itself right like yes Oh, okay. There it's are two. Yeah, there's there are two lights. You know, it's nice that we have this roof line here. The uh, one about right here, and then one about right here. There'll be two of those uh, porch lights that we had shown. Okay. Thank side. you. Sure. All right. Thanks, Janet. Jack. Hello. Um, um, I had like three things I want to talk about, but the, the ADA. Uh, you know, people have asked you know, a bunch of questions, but I guess one thing I'm not clear on is in terms of the uh, uh, access to the building, because uh, I know there's stairs. Is there just a, how is it like a wheelchair uh, accessible entrance to the building? Um, wh where is that? Pull this back up, Jack, if you can see. Oh, here corner of the building. I'll go back okay. land in a moment, or or the aerial, really. So it's in this corner. Okay. All right. And so that's... it's it'll be right over here, and so that's why when we're, we're talking with what what you know we had proposed the accessible route, and, and it's relatively flat, basically flat from these parking spaces, you know, to have van access over to this corner. But well, what we mm -hmm. just talked about with Janet, uh, Janet was putting something right here, you know, potentially an ADA parking space there. This is where there's a little bit of a slope, plus they do need access to that barn. Um, so that's why I think, you know, this space right here probably makes the most sense. And then this, the, the entryway here will be at grade with the surrounding area. Thank you, Tom. Uh, the second question is uh, the 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 surface of the of the drive and parking, and you know, given the 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 size of the trucks that come in and out of there. So, um, how often do you know does Wagner have to kind of resurface in terms of you know bringing in additional you know milling material and planing and and that sort of thing? Because I, I just thought that the trucks were pretty pretty large there. It would tear up 
you know, that kind of surface. Um, yeah, I mean, they are. Uh, and Barry, I'm going to ask you in a minute to if you know the answer, but um, you know, Jack, yes, they are pretty large, and and I don't think the Wagners want to have any of them stru uh, stuck. So they they probably make sure that it's a pretty compacted, um, and the, and the trucks in their nature will compact the surfaces there because this you know it's their livelihood to get that wood, which yeah. I can only imagine how much, you know, the 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 trailers weigh with that wood. Um, so I I don't know Barry, I don't know if you know. Yes, yeah, so uh, they use millings on the surface there, and what the trucks tend to do is really really pack it hard. And I have never been there to see it soft because the trucks compact the millings, millings being the stuff that's ground off the highways when they're resurfacing. So okay. it's actually black top, but it's, you know, in loose and they put it down and then the trucks have pa excuse me, packed it like a roller would. So I find it to be always really, really hard. Okay, thank you. Uh, and last thing, it, 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 with regard to the additional signage, I'd be all for that. Um, and maybe even putting like some temporary, you know, permanent temporary type features like safety cones with signs on them, uh, just, you know, scattered around there would, would be, I think, a, not a bad thing to do as well. So uh, thank you. Lo looks like a good project. Thanks, Jack. All right, Jack. Uh, next, we have Tom. Sure, thanks guys. I had, this is a great presentation. I'm um, excited about the project. I, uh, my question came up just a moment ago. I had a question about the surface and ADA and some other things, but um, in regard to the second level, is there a reason why that does not need to be accessible? If that's an office space and in what form, uh, how, how would one define office space in terms of accessibility? Yeah, so I, I believe because it's not open to the public that it doesn't have to be accessible. And so but if people are being employed there, don't don't they need to be they can't you would need to hire um, for accessible people or for people who need access, right? Yeah, and I mean I don't even want to go down the road of thinking about discrimination and all of those, you know, reasonable accommodations, et cetera. Um you know, they there would be the ability to access these offices through this door. This second floor is, as I understand it, for storage. You know, again, not to go down the road, but I would imagine that any employee who is not able to go up to the second floor would not be required to go up to the second floor. But, and I don't know if Barry, if you've got a, and this is what our architect tells us uh, as far as what the accessibility code requires. Um, sure. I, it was just a, a, a question and a thought. Thanks. Sure. Sure. All right. Um, I guess I, I had a couple of questions. One is, um, uh, and this is really just, I'm just curious, uh, what Barry's role is in this? I know, understand, Tom, you're the, uh, the legal counsel, and is Barry in partnership with the Wagners or something? I am not in partnership with the Wagners. I'm just helping facilitate the build and working with John Kuhn to design the project. Okay, thank you. No, uh, and, I guess. And then I, uh, I guess it was a question for Chris um, and how this commercial use fits in with the zoning of the farm of the agricultural land. And, you know, by approving this, are we what happens if this grows and becomes successful and turns into something of the scale of the Atkins farm uh, shop in, in South Amherst? You want me to answer that? Sure. Yeah. So they need to adhere to the requirements of the class one farm stand, which requires that 25% of the products that they're selling be grown on the site and that 50% of the products be grown in Massachusetts. And then they can you know, find other products that are you know, compatible with what they're selling to fill up the other percentage. Um, so the building commissioner is gonna ask for um, proof of what, what it is that they're selling and we'll be you know, checking on them periodically to make sure that what they're selling complies with those requirements. So if you have a property that's 
five acres or more and you're doing farming on it, it's considered a farm according to state law. And this property is a farm according to state law. It's bigger than five acres. Um, so the class one farm stand is allowed here, even though it's a residential district. I think if it ever got to the point of being you know, much larger or much busier, it may have to be moved elsewhere because this is not a place that it would be necessarily compatible to have something like Atkins. But, um, you know, for the purposes that we're looking at now, I think that this fits well in this environment. Um, but again, you know, if, if we're starting to see hundreds of people, we're not going to see hundreds of people, but if it went in that direction, I think the building commissioner would have a conversation with the Wagners and say, you know, you really need to find another location for this because it doesn't fit within the residential district. Okay, and, and it sounds like you've, you've started to answer my next question, which was, uh, will this building not need review and approval by the building commissioner for the code, for the Massachusetts Actual Architectural Access Board, for the plumbing code, if, if that actually applies? Yes. Um, so we don't, need to, we don't need to actually get too down in the weeds in terms of the layout of the building for for this site plan review? No, and I did talk to the building commissioner today about the fact that the bathroom wouldn't be accessible, um, handicapped accessible, and that the downstairs and the upstairs wouldn't be. And he said, well, as long as the public isn't invited to go there, that that would be satisfactory. As long as the area where the public is invited to go is handicapped accessible, that's what he would be looking for. And there would be a building permit required to build this building and all of the usual things that are looked at when a building permit is um, is requested would be looked at here. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you had your hand up, but do you wanna say anything else? Me? Oh, yes. I don't, th I think I might've been wanting to answer a previous question. Okay, uh, Maria. Uh, thanks, Doug, and thanks, Tom. Um, I think all my questions were answered very adequately as far as lighting and accessibility and then the, the uh, level of uh, quality of the, the ground plane. So I think that's all been covered. And I, I was trying to quickly look up the definition of farm stand while you guys were chatting. But um, so I guess farm stands would never, like you were saying, Chris, never get to level of Atkins. And there wouldn't be like events here where, you know, um, dozens of people would show up and, and be parking all over the place, right? Because farm stands really just to sell a small quantity of site uh, produced products, right? So it wouldn't, I, I don't know if this is a question. Well, I was trying to look up the definition of farm stand really quickly, but it, it's never gonna get to that level of um, use. In other words, it's just a small retail space, right? Uh, Chris, do you want to answer that? Yeah. So um, the, the kinds of things that Maria was talking about, like events, um, those are not allowed in, you know, the residential districts. We've had questions about that before from other landowners who own farms. And unfortunately, those kinds of events aren't allowed. But we may want to change our zoning bylaw to allow those types of things. But right now, they're not allowed. So this is unlikely to you know, become a place where there's a lot of traffic coming to it. And um, certainly if, if things were to become problematic, people would complain to the building commissioner and then we would know that there's something going on here that it doesn't fit within the scope of what is now being proposed. The um, definition of the class one farm stand is in section, what is it? 3.312 of the zoning bylaw. So it's part of that use category chart. And it's one of the first few things in that use category chart. So um, there's a pretty clear definition of it. And I actually think that we did define it. Yes, we did on page two of the development application report. There's um, a definition of a class one farm stand and what is required to go on there. You know, what kinds of things should, can be sold there. So you might want to refer to that. It, it laps over into page three, but that's a pretty good description. And that's also taken from state law. So our um, zoning bylaw matches state law with regard to the uh, farm stand definition. All right. Thank you. 
Are there any more board comments or questions? All right. At this time, I will ask for any public comments on this project. I guess uh, I don't see any. Chris, I assume that abutters were notified that this hearing was going to be taking place? Yes, they were. OK. All right, so I don't see any public comments. All right, any, any final comments from the board? All right, uh, what, does anybody want to make a motion? Uh, Johanna, go ahead. Well, I guess I'll, I'll just say it seems, um, you know, it's a huge property overall. The idea that they are going to start selling some of their meat that they produce locally kind of on the farm seems, it just seems cool. Like it's consistent with kind of the historic usage of that land and, um, you know, kind of making it possible for people who live in Amherst to be even more connected to the food and the farms that operate here. And so, um, I recognize that that's, you know, it's a little bit outside the, like our job is to look at lighting and surfaces and structures, but like overall, I think it's gonna be a, um, has the potential to be a neat feature and addition to our community. All right. I guess I, I, you reminded me of one thing I wanted to ask, which had, maybe it's really not our purview, but there is a restroom in this building. And I was just wondering how you were dealing with the, the effluent from that facility. Barry, connecting it to the sewer, right? I think the sewer goes on uh, Northeast Street. And so we, we have to figure out whether we need a sewer pump. I just don't know what the grades are gonna be when we ultimately build, but we're gonna make sure it, it, it's either pumped up or it flows downhill, preferably the latter. Okay, so it'll go to the sewer. There won't be a septic field right in association with this. Before they redid Northeast Street this last year, we connected in a stub, a sewer stub into the town sewer and ran it into the property line. Uh, we talked Kurt Guilford and Jason about that and that's what they, we put it where they wanted to go. And so it's all set to connect to the town sewer. Okay, great. All right, would anybody like to make a motion about this application? Janet, I see your hand. Um, should I, I'll close the hearing and then make a motion to approve. So I sure. move. Sure, and we did we did talk about various potential conditions as well. So, um, Chris, should we go ahead and make the motion now and then talk about conditions? Why don't we talk about conditions first? Yeah. I think that would be helpful. All right, sorry, Janet. It's okay. Um, so I wrote down that we had some conversation about the lighting and the potential condition for the adequacy of that and I guess the code compliance in terms of the illumination for a pedestrian path in the vicinity of traffic. Um, and then um, Janet, you, you, you had raised the issue of a potential condition for a revision to the site plan to have a parking, an ADA parking spot closer to the, to the entry. Uh, were there any other conditions that were that I've missed? I think um, I didn't have a chance to write up conditions for this project, but I think that it would be worthwhile to state a condition that says that the entries to the building must be handicapped or the main entry to the building must be handicapped accessible because there's no grading plan associated with this um, site plan that wasn't submitted. So. Um, and that wouldn't automatically come up in the building official it would review. it would but i think it's worthwhile to put something in here about that okay and then chris i guess the other question would be relative to um that additional sign so we're using you know eight square feet along the road another four square feet on the building and then we're going to have that pedestrian safety sign and or maybe signs is Mr. Jemzik had suggested. I don't know if we need an Article 8 waiver. Um, we'd ask for one now if, if you think it necessary, just so 
you know, when we have it out there, there's some record of the planning board being okay with the addition of, you know, the, the safety signs, so-called. How many safety signs do you expect to install? Like between two and four? You want to yeah, say I think I think that's probably a fair number. So you could say the pl planning board could um, have a condition stating that um, if the applicant wants to install between two and four safety signs, um, that that would be satisfactory under um, section 8.5 of the zoning bylaw, but you might want to give some limit to how big they would be. How big are the, how big do you imagine those signs to be, Tom? You think two by two? Barry, you think that's, is that too big, two square feet? I mean, I think that's a little bigger. I, I envision it like a regular traffic control sign, like a, almost like a stop sign. Like one by uh, two, a one wide, two high or something like that. Yes, I think that would be fine. <laughs> like that draft uh, diamond over your shoulder, Barry? Yeah, like that one. Perfect. <laughs> One by one or one by two, and you install between two and four of those. And if those um, needed to have a section eight point five waiver, the board would agree to grant that waiver. Um, there were some other things that I want that I was interested in, like um, providing information about the products that are going to be sold to the building commissioner at the time that the. Mm -hmm. Um, the building permit is requested. Uh, Chris, I'm uh, I'm doing a little math in my head, and I'm thinking if we made the safety sign limit uh, two and a quarter square feet, then it could be eighteen inches square rather than two feet squ square. So that makes sense. Two and a quarter square feet, 18 inches square, and between two and four of them, depending on what the applicant feels like they need. And I, are, I don't remember the actual allowable square footage of signage in the bylaw, but it's the 12, 12 square so, feet. So we're using eight, eight of those square feet out at the road and we're using the other four on the building? Yes. Is there any maximum distance from the road where it does beyond that distance? It doesn't matter what the size of the sign is. I no, I don't. Think okay, so. so on a parcel like that parcel, which is probably fifty acres, if they had a sign at the rear, you know, the east edge of it, that would apply. I believe so. Yeah, it seems strange, but that's true. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so do Janet. you agree to have a condition about the products, um, a description of the products to be submitted to the building commissioner at the time of the application to the for the building permit? Yeah. Um, oh, and if uh, so, it should be managed according to the management plan built according to the plans that were submitted. And if the plan changes, then um, they would come back to the planning board for uh, review, right? That, those are the kind of standard conditions that you have. Yeah. And Chris, I'll update the management plan just because we had 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., but we've now represented it's going to be dawn to dusk and then maybe a little later during, you know, when dusk is early. So I'll update that and get you a, a complete management plan for the file. And would you also update the um, plan of the site to show a new parking space location? I will, yes. So when um, those plans come in, I can bring them to the planning board for review and they can be approved at that time. Okay. All right, and then we'll put a date in those, um, those conditions. Okay. So if that's the case, do you want us just to hold off on a vote this evening? Um, for us, if you could have the vote, that would be great, just so we can. Yeah, just, I think it's I think it's okay going. to have the vote and then bring the plans back, and you know they can't get a building permit until they update the plans. Okay. Um, Janet, you have your hand up. I was just going to read to the board the um, 
the waiver language in section 8.5 on um, and it says basically, um, you know, there are sign regulations are very detailed, but it says that um, we could waive um, the sign regulations uh, for compelling reasons of public convenience, public safety, aesthetics, or site design. And so it seems clear that um, public safety would be the um, reason to waive, because obviously we want people to be able to walk safely and to alert the trucks that people are going to be walking around. So do you want me to try to... Um, make a motion to close the hearing and list all these conditions. Um, if you've for, been making notes, I mean, we, we I could have been, I, I've been having, I have been making notes, but I'm not sure they're going to be great notes. Well, so, I think, I mean, you could make your motion and then we could have Chris go through her notes of all the conditions that she's got. That would be lovely. <laughs> so I'll make a motion to close the hearing. All right. Uh, Jack, are you raising your hand to second that? Yes, I'll second. Thank you. All right, Janet, do you want to go back and make a motion to uh, actually okay. let's vote? Let's vote to yeah. close the hearing. Um, all right, all right, uh, Johanna, we'll start with you. Aye. All right, um, Maria. Yes. And Jack. Yes. Uh, Tom. Aye. And Andrew. Aye. And Janet. Aye. And I'm an I. Sounds good. All right, the meeting is closed, or the, the hearing is closed. Um, now, Janet, would you like to make a motion to approve the site plan review with the conditions that Chris will be uh, reminding us of in a moment. So I so move. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody want to second that? All right, Jack. Yeah, I'll second that. And do you want to include um, waivers as well as conditions? They've asked for waivers from the landscape plan, soil erosion plan, traffic impact statement, construction logistics plan pollution and hazardous materials plan and demolition and historic preservation plan. Anybody object to those waivers? No. Janet, your hand is up. Are you? Oh, no, sorry, residual. OK. OK, so now you'd like me to read conditions. Um, so first condition would be built substantially in accordance with plans submitted to the planning board and approved. And the approval date will be some date hence once you get the plan back. Then the development shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on that subsequent date. <clears throat> changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plans or to the exterior of the building shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. Uh, the purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change and to determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require a modification of the site plan review. Um, this is one that uh, we've been putting in lately. You can decide if you want to put it in or not. This site plan review approval shall expire within two years of the date that it's filed with the town clerk unless it has been both recorded at the Registry of Deeds and substantial construction or use has commenced within the two year period. Um, I don't know if you wanna do that or not. Any objection to that, uh, Tom? No, that's fine. We just have to pull a building permit, I think is what the law requires. Yep, and begin construction, I think. Um, and then you had a, um, condition about lighting, that it would be dark sky compliant, that it wouldn't shine onto adjacent properties, and that it would be adequate. A adequate for the purpose of lighting um, the area where people are walking and driving. Right, for the safety of the pedestrians. Um, and then you had a... Um, a condition that you wanted to see a revised plan that has the ADA spot closer to the building. So that would be a, an updated site plan. 
prior to the issuance of the building permit. Um, then there was another one that we talked about that said that the entry shall be ADA accessible. Um, and there was one that said that you were approving the ability to have additional safety signs under section 8.5 of the zoning bylaw for reasons of public safety. And you would approve between two and four signs, each of which could be um, 18 square inches. And what else? 18, in, 18 inches square. 18 inches square. square. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I wrote down. I just said the wrong thing. Um, and that uh, information would be provided to the building commissioner at the time of the uh, building permit application to describe um, the products that are proposed to be sold here. And that you would update the management plan, that you would receive an updated management plan along with an updated site plan before the issuance of a building permit. And that's it. Okay. All right, does anybody else want to say anything before we vote on uh, Janet's motion and the conditions? Oh, did I, I just also Chris? say that um, you would um, approve the fact that this complies with the relevant sections of section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw. Okay. Did we get a second? I can't remember. I think Jack did. Okay. Okay, well then why don't we go ahead and uh, have that vote. Uh, Jack, why don't you go first? Aye. And Tom. Was that me? Yes. I. I'll, I'll vote aye too. If... <laughs> <laughs> Andrew. Aye. And uh, Janet. Hi. Johanna. Hi. Maria. Approved. And I'm an I as well. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Barry. Good luck. All right. So with that, we move on. The time is 7.36. Um, why don't we go ahead and move into the Amherst College hearings? Let's see. All right. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2022-08, Amherst College 197 and 205 South Pleasant Street and 38 Woodside Avenue and 155 to 175 South Pleasant Street. Request site plan review approval under section 3.330.0 of the zoning bylaw to renovate and expand an existing building at 197 South Pleasant Street to create an academic building to be known as the Aliki Parati and Seth Frank Lyceum and to construct a service drive from Woodside Ave across the property at, Woods, at 38 Woodside Ave to the Lyceum and a woodland path across property at 155 to 75 South Pleasant Street to connect to the parking lot at Newport House, including waivers to sign regulations under section 8.5 of the zoning bylaw and associated site amenities, lighting and landscaping. Map 14A, parcels 190, 191, 194, and 195. So Chris, do you want to do these together? Um, that would be great. Um, so what we're prepared to do is um, to uh, introduce the, the folks that have come here. I'm sorry, which Chris were you talking to? <laughs> yeah, I was actually talking to Chris Prestrup. I'm sorry. Okay, we, yeah, we're gonna have to make sure to go with Christine. Okay. Yes, I think at least um, 
the first two should be done together and it probably makes sense to do all three of them together. All right. So they could so, be a joint public hearing. All right, then uh, I'll go ahead and read the second one. Uh, now the time is 738 and I'm we're going to open the hearing for a second Amherst College project in or application in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law chapter 40A. This public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard. Regarding yes, a special permit 2022-03 Amherst College at 197 South Pleasant Street. Request a special permit under Article 6, Section 6.60 and Table 3, Footnote A of the Zoning Bylaw to modify the front setback requirement for a new academic building to be known as the Alaki Parati and Seth Frank Lyceum, map 14A parcel 195 in the RG zoning district. And then the third hearing, also in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law chapter 40A, um, is for site plan review 2022-09 Amherst College at 32 Northampton Road, request site plan review approval under section 3.330.0 of the zoning bylaw to expand existing parking lot at Newport House from 17 spaces to 28 spaces, including two handicap spaces, including lighting and drainage improvements and stormwater detention and infiltration. Map 14A-189, uh, in the RG zoning district. All right, so for these three hearings that we're gonna to conduct together, uh, is, are there any board member disclosures? I do not see any. All right, Chris Chamberlain, you are now on. Great, um, and actually, and sorry, go ahead. I was okay. gonna say over in the attendees, Chris, is a Bruner caught Zoom. Is that person supposed to become a panelist? Yes. And okay. also there was a late addition of you could let Jessica Alpert in also as a panelist. Absolutely. Great. Um, so while they're logging on, um, I am Chris Chamberlain. I'm principal civil engineer with Berkshire Design Group in Northampton. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance for my scratchy voice, and I may have to mute myself and cough. It's not COVID, but my five-year-old did bring a cold home to share with us last weekend, um, but we'll, we'll power through. Um, here with me are Tom Davies, uh, Director of Design at Amherst College, Mark Andrews, Project Manager for Amherst College, Lauren Stimson, Principal Landscape Architect with Stephen Simpson Associates, uh, Jess Alpert, Project Manager for Stimson. Um, Jason Forney, uh, Principal Architect with Bruner Cott Architects, and Christopher Nielsen, um, Project Manager for the uh, Bruner, Bruner Cott Architects. Um, and so what we're going to do is give uh, an overview of the site, background of the project. Um, I want to step through sort of in our own words what the permit requests are, because as, as was clear from Doug's introduction, this, uh, there's some complications just because of the, the number of properties involved and what we need to do. Um, and then we'll give you a detailed overview of the uh, primary site, which is for the proposed Lyceum, go through some of the site engineering, um, and then uh, look at the architecture and specifically um, around uh, the purpose of our special permit request for the reduced setback. Um, and then uh, toward the end, we'll look at the Newport House lot, uh, which is on uh, Route 9, where the parking expansion is, uh, which is a, technically a separate site plan review, but is really uh, part and parcel of this overall project. Um, so to start, I'll, I'll turn it over to the folks at Amherst College um, to give sort of uh, an overview and background of this project. And uh, I'll also share our screens and start with um, sort of the neighborhood plan Again, with this the core of downtown, Amherst College campus, and we are looking at this block right here, and specifically uh, this site of the Lyceum and this building, which is known as Newport House. Tom? Great. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, 
you'll, of course, many of you anyway will remember this from June of 2021 when we did a preliminary review with you. Um, and uh, I, I guess I just want to say that uh, this has been, you know, a, a little bit complicated, but it also has been a, a real model for um, the town working with us. And, you know, we've had many, many meetings with various town staff to talk through the different issues, what might come up, how to best deal with things. Um, Chris and, and everybody else has been terrific to work with. And um, we, we've counted it up and I think that there are 10 uh, different uh, meetings over the course of the last year um, working through all these different things. So hopefully there's no surprises here. Um, and uh, I, I just want to compliment everybody. It's been a, a, just a model for how to work effectively together, um, even when it's a little bit of a tricky uh, problem to solve. Um, so um, with that said, I, I won't, I mean, I can go into anything that anybody would like to go into. This is a, an academic building. Um, it uh, is going to house the, the history department and the, the Center for Humanistic Inquiry both of which of course exist today, elsewhere on campus, and um, create a, uh, a little bit of a different uh, academic um, feel uh, and extend the academic uh, buildings that, that march along um, South Pleasant Street, um, you know, another, another lot to the south. Um, so I'll, I'll stop talking there and, and, and get on with the process, but just know that I can go into any any um, aspect of this, you know, big picture or detailed um, at the board's direction. Thanks. Um, and so uh, just big picture overview of the site. Uh, this has rotated 90 degrees from what we were looking at before with north to our right, looking at the screen. Um, and uh, as Tom alluded to, um, existing uh, Amherst College institutional buildings here with the president's residence being the closest to our site on uh, the Cadigan Hall to the rear here. This would be the new Lyceum building, uh, which incorporates a remodel of an existing formerly single family home. Uh, in this location, uh, the site also had a single family home that was relocated elsewhere in town already. Uh, in this location here. Um, this is that Newport lot we mentioned with our reconstructed parking lot. There's a woodland path connecting these sites through this uh, wooded lot, um, and as well as a service drive here to Woodside. Um, I do want to highlight, um, because this was on the plans, it was noted in our cover letter and in the application, um, that the plans do show as a bid alternate a new um, alternate material crosswalk in this location. Uh, what we submitted were our bid plans with everything that is proposed to be on this work down to every detail, and it was a large drawing set that included this alternate, which was for pricing purposes. The college could understand whether this was something that could be pursued. It is not proposed as part of this site plan review uh, it, because it's in the public right of way. If the college decides that they want to pursue this. Uh, it does have to go through town council review. Um, so we acknowledge this is on the plan, but is not part of the proposal. And I just want to make that, that clear up front. And so um, the, the request for the project at large is a new academic building on this west side of South Pleasant Street. Um, the planning board previously endorsed an ANR. Uh, that set the property lines as they're shown on this screen here. Um, and we require three separate approvals for the planning board, um, a site plan review for the main project site, which is the Lyceum, uh, inclusive of uh, the driveway here uh, and the woodland path. The existing house that is being renovated and added onto currently meets the zoning setback for the residential zone that it's in, which is 15 feet. The house is about 20 feet back. Um, the educational use of this project doubles the setback. And so therefore the setback for the front yard on this property would be 30 feet for this project. Um, but the planning board has the ability to reduce that setback through special permit, which is what we've requested to reduce it down to allow, and I'll 
we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a little bit, down to the approximately 20 foot setback that we have here so that this building, the new addition of the building and the existing building can remain consistent with the existing site. And as we'll demonstrate a little bit later, consistent with the other buildings on the block. That is a special permit action, a very narrow one that we're uh, requesting for this project. And then finally, um, just because it was sort of cleaner uh, permit wise to do this separately, we have applied for site plan review for a separate project, which is on this Newport house lot. There is no change whatsoever proposed to the building that is on this lot. We are simply taking an existing 17 car parking lot, uh, primarily rearranging it with a small expansion uh, of the area and creating 28 spaces in this location. Um, broadly, um, the zoning compliance, I know the, the development application form um, showed the, the dimensional regs for each of these lots. Um, we are in the RG zone, general residence, because on this side, we're, we're outside of that educational zone. Um, this existing use is single family residence and the proposed use is educational nonprofit under 3.330. Um, and uh, we've uh, provided uh, information on, on all the basic zoning uh, compliance. Um, and so with that, we're gonna turn our focus to the Lyceum site itself. And I'll ask my colleagues at Stimson to uh, walk us through sort of the, the design aspects of this. Sure, hi everybody. My name is Lauren Stimson. Um, so Chris already mentioned that the approach to the project is um, going to be coming from the east side of campus. So north and um, Main Street downtown is to the right. And so we've got a new approach. Can I actually draw on this? It might be helpful because it's so zoomed out. Um, a new oh, walk that's coming. Also bring you in. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks, Chris. Um, we've got a new walkway that's coming um, up to the front of the building, which is seen here and a new terrace, stone terrace um, at the front of the building, the new main entry. And there's a Lyceum garden, which is on the west side of the building, which I just highlighted. And another walk that he pointed out that's coming from the Newport House parking lot that comes through this woodland and connects to the front of the building through the Lyceum garden. Um, the service drive comes from Woodside Avenue and it comes to the west side of the building where we have one accessible um, handicapped spot and then also uh, a spot for service vehicles and an area for utility um, enclosure. So we've got our um, recycling and trash totes at the rear side of the building and um, access for that would be from the side. and. The back of the building has a walkway to enter to the rear, but that is only for maintenance and for access um, for facilities. And the, there's another side walkway that comes off of the town sidewalk right here to the front terrace. So these are the, the two main paths. The probably better if we, if we were to flip to the other plan, Chris, to show, there we go. This is a little bit easier to see. Um, the intent here. There's a lawn to the south, a south-facing lawn off of the Lyceum Terrace, and there is um, vegetation, new vegetation on the north side as screen planting, the west side along the property edge for buffer planting, and also on the south side of the property for screen and buffer planting. New street trees are proposed but that would come under um, separate review um, through the town um, tree warden who we've already been in contact with. Great. You wanna add anything? Um, so I'll take away the pretty picture and, uh, oh, and uh, could you talk about the lighting? Yeah, sure, site lighting. There's um, a few types of fixtures um, that are proposed and the bollard fixtures are located on the main path up to the front door of the building. So I'm just going to circle these and they're also located along the woodland path connecting back to Newport lot 
And then there's a second type of fixture, which is a light pole, a light pole, which is taller. And those are located in key key moments along the service drive near the back of house um, at the service area. And then also coming from the main, I think there's another one. Sorry, it's hard to see this here. Um, right there, I believe. And then there is a third type of lighting, which is wall lighting. So that's um, flush mounted wall lighting. These are two um, seat walls that hold up the terrace at the edge of the building and define that front terrace. And those would be flush mounted um, wall lights. And then the third, the fourth type is, it looks like fifth type actually, um, coming off the building. These are actually building mounted lights. Architect can talk about them further if there are questions. Can I just add one thing, Chris, uh, before you zoom too yes. far out? Um, people probably know this, but um, you know, all the notifications went out to the abutters and they all came to us because we are the abutters. We've got a big pile of them. Presumably you didn't have any issues. <laughs> um, so looking at um, site utilities, uh, we will be replacing the existing utility connections onto the site as they're uh, sized for a single family home and they need to be uh, increased. Um, water service will come directly off of South Pleasant Street. Um, sanitary service uh, will discharge to Walnut Street where it then runs south through New Sewer. Um, the elect site electrical and communications is going to come off of Woodside um, underground coming off of a pole and then underground uh, along this driveway um, up to the main site. Um, there's no gas. Uh, you know, the, the college uh, is obviously moving away from fossil fuels um, everywhere. So this is uh, pretty much an all electric building. Um, and so those, those are the connections here that we have to deal with. Um, and then the stormwater management overall um, on the Lyceum site, uh, the, uh, the drainage from the roof of the building and some of these hard surfaces um, are a combination of piped and overland flow, uh, which incorporate, we work closely with Stimson to um, create a series of bioswales and rain gardens. Um, there's a lot of slope to deal with on this site, um, especially once uh, we've created a flattened terrace area. Um, and so there's gonna be a series of uh, logs that have been designed almost as steps uh, to bring this water down uh, on the surface, um, allow little pools for, for settling, uh, temperature attenuation and those sorts of things as we um, exit the site. And if you're up for a walk in a rainy day, um, it should be actually a, a nice dynamic site feature. Um, the sort of backbone engineering wise of the drainage system is actually occurring on the Newport House lot. Um, this is a lot that already contains uh, quite a bit of impervious area that's currently uncontrolled. Um, and so we're proposing an underground detention and infiltration basin uh, within this parking lot, which is gonna capture uh, the vast majority of the impervious area from this lot and attenuate it, uh, over attenuate it really, so that on net for this uh, project as a whole, we'll reduce runoff, uh, improve water quality um, and increase stormwater infiltration. And of course, as always, the engineering plans have been sent to DPW. I understand uh, you received copies of the uh, comments. Um, notwithstanding a few comments about the uh, crosswalks and uh, infrastructure in the public right of way, uh, which we've already um, sort of uh, touched on, the comments related to the engineering of the interior of the site were quite minor and we're uh, more than happy to incorporate all of those into the plan. Um, the, as was noted, um, the main Lyceum site includes uh, just two parking spaces and ADA space adjacent to the building as well as a service space. Um, the, the way to think about this is that the campus parking is the parking facility um, for this project. Uh, the college obviously has uh, several hundred parking spaces uh, for their students, staff, and visitors. Um, a part of that campus parking supply is located on this Newport House lot, which is um, also being expanded. Um, but the reality is that uh, people arriving to campus park somewhere on campus and then um, generally uh, navigate as pedestrians from there. 
Um, and so really uh, the majority uh, we anticipate of all of the traffic coming to this building is really uh, pedestrian traffic, uh, some of it from the Newport lot, but actually probably a majority of it coming from the core of campus um, and crossing South Pleasant Street. Um, we've noted that, uh, that uh, this crosswalk is not part of the PROS project. If this is not built, um, due to cost or any issues with getting it permitted or anything like that. The, there is an existing high visibility crosswalk um, at this location right here, which then um, connects through sidewalks to the site. Um, the existing site has two driveway curb cuts for the single family homes on South Pleasant Street. Those are both to be closed. Uh, there will be the addition, of course, of the service drive curb cut on Woodside Avenue. Um, and uh, and so overall, um, we actually think that traffic, literal traffic to this site is probably decreased compared to the two single family homes. But at the very least, um, uh, we conclude that there's, there's pretty minimal changes um, to this portion of the site. Um, and so with that, uh, I wanna turn it over to the architect um, just to talk a little bit um, about the appearance of the, the building from the public, and then also to get really specific about the, uh, the setback question. Thanks, Chris. Um, so my name is Christopher Nielsen. I work for Bruner Cott. I'm one of the architects on this project. Um, and I think the, the main consideration here from a site plan perspective is talking about the setback on the east side of the building um, and our uh, public facing architecture. And so what we have on the screen here, and I think I can actually annotate it as well, um, the face of the building right here in green, um, this is the existing brick residence. Uh, and our approach was to create a volume adjacent to that along uh, South Pleasant Street, just to the south of that, that lined up um, with that building um, in equal sort of scale uh, and being respectful uh, for that building. Um, so Chris, I think if you can go actually to the next slide, clear those. We did some early study, um, just sort of looking at the scale of this neighborhood. So on the top, it's the elevation that's looking at the existing buildings on this site. On the right hand side, you see the buildings up the hill, President's House, Morgan Hall, College Hall. Um, and then our building is the Lyceum, the gabled roof portion uh, here is the existing building. Um, and then the addition is off to the south, which is to the left. Um, and down below, we look in plan. We did a study to just look at what is the actual setback of these buildings um, and, and where could we be most respectful of the neighborhood in our addition uh, to 197 South Pleasant Street. Um, Chris, I think there's one more image. Um, and so in the end, what we think we've come up with is a building that is reflecting the scale of the existing building and a bit of the rhythm of the uh, windows um, that still is maintaining an institutional academic building for uh, the college. Thanks, Chris. Um, and I think. I'm going to have to jump back a little bit because um, the last part that I want to talk about is the new Newport House lot over here. We've touched on most of the main points here, but um, just, just sort of pause on this as, as a separate site plan review. Um, this is an existing nonprofit educational use. There is no change proposed to that use. Um, previously, this building was used uh, for, had some classroom and meeting space. At present, it's entirely a dorm. Um, the uh, proposed work is includes stormwater management, uh, lighting, as well as a small amount of planting. Um, the lighting was uh, is consistent with uh, the overall lighting plan, which Lauren stepped you through. Um, there is a proposal um, to add a small amount of planting uh, at this intersection of the woodland path with the parking lot, um, which uh, also highlights this um, ADA crossing as we get from, from the path and uh, the ADA parking spaces into the building. Um, and, uh, you know, this uh, questions came up about sort of the traffic um, associated with this parking lot. Um, what we want to just highlight is that as part of the overall uh, campus parking supply, 
Um, these are spaces that are typically used, have turnover of once or twice a day um, as people arrive to campus um, and then circulate around campus primarily as pedestrians um, before um, uh, leaving at a single time. Um, so those are the uh, key points that we wanted to highlight. Um, I will keep uh, these plans up, uh, but we're more than happy to address any questions that you may have. All right. Thank you, Chris, and, and your entire team. That was a nice presentation. Um, or uh, Chris, Chris Brestrup. I just wanted to point out that we have Nate Malloy here um, as a panelist, and he wrote the development application reports for um, both the Lyceum and Newport House. So he's probably the staff member who's most familiar with the project if you had questions for staff. Okay, thank you. Uh, board members, I see we just passed eight o'clock and we usually take a break around that time. Uh, would anybody like to in fact take a break at this time or shall we just continue until we finish with the Amherst project? Jack? Yeah, I'd like to take a short break. All right, great. So we will take a five minute break. Uh, it looks to me like it's 8.04. Why don't we come back uh, at 8.09 or at the worst 8.10. Uh, please uh, turn off your video and mute yourself. When you return, please turn on your video. Thank you.
All right, I'm seeing 810 on my cap on my uh, clock. So if you're hiding without your video on, please turn it back on. Uh, Johanna, do you want to say something before Andrew arrives? Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that I was going to turn off. I'm here, but I'm going to turn off my video while I scarf down some dinner really quickly. Okay, thank you. I want to comment on the fact that there are many more panelists tonight than there are attendees. We usually have the opposite situation. <laughs> so there are 18 panelists and five attendees. Yeah, the, the public doesn't seem all that interested in this project. <laughs> Although all the abutters are here. <laughs> right, right. He's going to make the same joke. Okay, good. Well, I hate to have Andrew miss anything here. Ah, there he is. Yes. I'm gonna go stop video. I'm just in, eating some food here, so. Okay. But I am listening. All right. Uh, does do, do, does anyone from the college want to say anything else before we get into questions and discussion? Okay. All right. So, board members, any any questions for the our panelists? Or am I the only one who wrote down some questions? Uh, Maria. Was there a site visit? Oh, good question. Chris? There was a site visit and um, we had, uh, let's see, we had Andrew and, um, let's see. Pro probably <laughs> Johanna. Johanna, yeah. Andrew, Johanna and Janet. <laughs> Well, Janet, you may be the only one who's not eating dinner. Would you mind doing the site visit? I will. I will start. Um, it was very icy on the on the lot, but we did. Um, we looked at the existing crosswalk and the um, possible crosswalk, um, and then also um, we examined the old building, which is um, sort of boarded up. It's like a very traditional brick building. Um, the site is quite has quite a bit of slope. Um, we we didn't really walk around that much because it was so treacherous, but we could see where the area where the gardens were going to be, and the um, I want to say brickwork, but the uh, stonework um, kind of a patio. Um, what else did we do? Um, we talked about the setback where it would you know where it was going to be versus where it should be. Um, the proposed setback is pretty much in line with the current building. Um, we discussed there's going to be solar, flat solar panels on the seal, on the roof. Um, they're going to do splits and um, you know be all electric. Um, Chris, what am I forgetting? Um, we didn't look at the long path, um, which is going to cut through the president, the, co the the college president's backyard, over to the dorm where the parking spaces are going to be. I actually drove around and looked at that. Um, it's a fairly long path through some woods. 
um, I don't think we really talked about most of the trees that were going to be removed from the um, Lyceum site were already down, so that wasn't really a topic of discussion. Um, and then I, you know, I drove around and I looked at the um, dorm building in the parking lot, which looks like a dorm building, and you know, I could see you know the parking lot. Um, I don't think we talked about the lighting. Am I forgetting something? I'm trying to. Um, we, we talked about how students would get to the building and then also um, because across the street is quite steep, so they would have to really come down a hill and, you know, fall into Route 116. So they probably would go around or start from um, Main Street um, or Route 9 and South Pleasant and come around that way. Um, and then also we discussed the parking issue um, where they're not, ex I was a little confused by this statement in the development report that there's not going to be any more parking than there already is because there's not adding staff. And it turns out that um, they're obviously adding some parking spaces over there, but they expect the staff to park there and just kind of walk up. Um, is that is that everything, Johanna? Johanna? I'd say the, the one other piece, sorry, Doug, is it okay if I jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, I think Janet did a really nice summary of our conversation from the site visit, the we did spend just a little bit of time talking about the different grades. So the grades, you know, downhill, looking over at the Amherst College campus and the, you know, connection with footpaths there. And then it was noted that the new gradual path would have, you know, undulations, but overall um, doesn't have quite the same challenges with grade um, as some of the more uh, the paths towards South Pleasant Street. Oh, and then we talked a bit about the building um, that's is, you know, which is planned to be used as an office um, along Walnut Avenue, and that would just return to being a dorm. So it wouldn't be really disruptive to anybody there, um, the construction and things like that. So it was kind of a short visit. We were really cold. You know? <laughs> okay, great. And I'll assume, Andrew, you don't want to add anything? No, I was going to just mention the, uh, the, the staging of that house. I think that was something that was addressed in the plan as well, whether uh, they'd be, would be able to use that as an office instead of having to bring a trailer on. I think, Jen, you had asked about geothermal, if I remember right, um, just in terms of whether that would be something that would be considered at the site and was shared that that was not uh, in consideration. But otherwise, I think it was a great summary. And it was cold. It was really cold. OK. All right, so board members, any questions for our, for our team from Amherst College? Um, Maria. Thanks, Doug. Okay. Uh, and thanks to everybody who attended to do the presentation. That's really beautiful renderings. Um, the 3D renderings are really just amazing. I think it's gonna be a, a gorgeous addition to the campus. Um, I think that the setbacks are not an issue in my mind, that it really sets with the scale of the street and adjacent buildings. The 3D renderings, not that we'd ever be, you know, 80 feet up in the sky, but I think it's really lovely the way it just sort of respects the adjacent building. Um, I think also that uh, the parking is not an issue in my mind. Um, just disclosure, my husband works for the college and the staff and faculty park in one spot and then it's a walking campus. They walk into town for coffee, they walk everywhere. So it, the, you know, the parking in my mind is not like you need parking next to every building that you're gonna use. It, they literally, you know, walk for miles uh, all over the place daily. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think that's the way this building will function as well. And um, I think uh, the entries, it's hard to see from the rendering, you know, how clear the entries will be, but I think in reality, it'll be obvious with the sort of that glassy centerpiece. But um, some some of the landscape, yeah, it's kind of hard to see exactly where, you know, signify come into this corner of the building. Um, but I, I think once, you know, the reality of it is in, in, in the space, it'll be clear sort of where the circulation is. I do have a little concern about that huge retaining wall. I always 
you know, we see the renderings, we see these plans and elevations, and then suddenly when it gets built, I'm like, oh my gosh, did we approve an eight-foot retaining wall? <laughs> and um, like what's being built on the corner of a uh, university, I didn't realize there was this huge retaining wall that we're going to be you know, the first thing you see. And this is really nicely masked with what you have right now with the landscaping, but there will be a railing at the top of that huge retaining wall, I imagine, but um, but hopefully the landscaping will hide that. And no one will wander there because there's no sidewalk or anything. But I guess my only questions are, are any of the, um, <clears throat> in plan it shows a few uh, seminar rooms and um, meeting, larger meeting spaces and think tanks, will any of those be used after hours, like after, you know, the normal sort of school day, not that, you know, things close down, but will that be accessed? Um, beyond like dark and uh, is it something that's only for you know I guess like nine to five or something or or will there be events or any kind of larger gatherings after dark in, in those <clears throat> larger spaces I'm not sure who would answer that exactly but just putting that question out there but otherwise I, I love the building I think it's I'm really excited I, I can't wait to see it in reality I'm happy to answer the question um, about the, the you know, schedule, the functioning. Um, so there, there are two things that we would anticipate happening uh, after hours. The first is just students using the building, kind of like they do the Science Center now, as a, a place to hang out and study. Um, you know, there's really nice um, open study space. The classrooms, seminar rooms will be available to them, you know, through card swipe access to be able to use those for, for group group work and, and that type of thing. Um, uh, the, the second thing is, is uh, on the ground floor, the space that, that you're looking at right here, the, the Center for Humanistic, Humanistic Inquiry um, does have, um, you know, kind of late afternoon is their, um, one of kind of one of their normal um, practices is to have uh, guest lectures or talks by the staff or for the staff um, and faculty um, in late afternoon. They generally start at about like 4.30 or something like that, you know, kind of toward the end of the academic day and might drift into like the 6.30 time frame or so. Um, and those are something that happen, uh, you know, you know, if, if we don't have a pandemic going on, maybe once a month or so. Um, and so, you know, they might be attended by 50 people, something like that. Um, so, so that we think will continue. Um, but beyond that, there really aren't kind of, you know, it's not a function space. It's not, it's, it, it's not going to be used for, you know, banquets or anything like that. Um, so we don't anticipate, um, very regular, um building usage in the evening other than as i say student studying all right thanks tom and thanks maria uh andrew thanks jack um or thanks jack. thanks doug um <laughs> it's just muscle memory um great presentation uh the materials were were very well done and ve but very exhaustive so i i will be honest i didn't make it through in uh, probably as much detail as, as maybe some other folks um, I wanted to start with just a comment, and I think I made this the, the last time we talked about this as well. I, I think the architecture looks stunning. Um, I really do. I think it's beautiful. It's very different, though, than what is currently there. Um, and, you know, to the extent that um, this approach into town is sort of more classical architecture, this is going to be something that's that's quite different. And it looks like even with the street plantings from, from, the, uh, from the views pr you provided us, it'll be something that's very visible. Um, I, I'm happy with it again. I think it's beautiful, but but curious whether um, that came into consideration at all, like just um, how it fits in with the broader context of buildings in the in kind of this stretch of South Pleasant Street. Uh, Tom or anybody on your team. Um, well, I guess maybe that that's best for Jason. Uh, sure. I, the short answer is no. Um, you know, we 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 didn't consider a, a traditional form, um, but I think Jason's probably um, much better than me at, at uh, describing the uh, the, the yeah. design process. I'll be happy to do that. So I'm Jason Forney, a principal with Bruner Cotter Architects. 
And it was, it's always been our sort of approach to think about the two build, the two pieces of this um, design sort of working together on South Pleasant Street, one new and one old, and sort of having a conversation with each other. And a lot of those approaches are, um, you know, good, good preservation practices with deal when dealing with old buildings. Um, you know, clearly the new building is below the eave of the existing one, um, it, which, you know, in, in which way it defers to it. Um, we think of them as, as compatible, but still clearly distinct because that allows the old building to kind of shine and be itself and the new building to be something different. And so there are a lot of regulating lines and window sizes and shapes, um, as well as the materials. Um, this is a, a stone building. Um, and so we worked hard to really think about how each side of this composition of this conversation is speaking with each other. Um, so that it looks and feels um, the way that it does. I think another important element is the um, what we call a sort of hyphen in the middle, which is more transparent that allows them to not, you know, be too close to each other, or have a relaxed uh, sort of meeting there in the middle. So it okay. was it was sort of, you know, intentional to um, be distinct but compatible. Okay. Uh, thanks for that answer. I, I will say, I guess, just um, this view, you can see the distinction, but for most people driving up and down the, the road, you won't probably, right? Because if you're driving southbound, that house is, uh, is, is the brick side is, is kind of quite hidden as, as you're coming from the south into town. Uh, I don't know that you'll actually see much of the brick building at all, but again, I think, the I think it's a beautiful building, so no complaints. Um, a couple of other real quick ones would be... Um, there was a page in our in our packet that talked about subcontract subcontractor parking, which was way, way, way far away. And I'm just curious: is that where like the, the people who are actually working on the building um, are going to be parking? You know, past the tennis courts and almost on like Southeast Street? Is that is that the case? Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. and and. And they, they get shuttled. They, their subcontracts um, are, are um, bought out with uh, transport of the workers included in their bids. Okay, so like if they arrive with tools or things like that, they'll be shuttled to the job site. They're not gonna have to lug a, a toolbox for a mile. Okay. Um, the um, the sidewalk, I know you, you know you mentioned that that was out of scope for discussion today. I did wanna point out, I mean, yesterday, it was very icy and it won't be every day for sure, but the nature of this current sidewalk crossing being on the south side of Walnut, and uh, this was explained very well to us yesterday, um, but as you, uh, let me see if I can just kind of, you know, as you, as you cross this, oops, no, oh, there you go, yeah. It's just, this, this goes down and that goes down. And so, you know, I was in a walking boot yesterday and like it was icy and kind of tough to, to manage this. And someone almost fell um, who was trying to cross it as well. So um, just a, a vote to uh, try to get that crossing set up um, whenever you can. I think it'll make it much safer of, a, of access for somebody who is uh, certainly having trouble walking around. Um, and and then the, I guess the other is um, just the status of using that house as um, as a construction office, is that, um, is that, uh, has that been approved or is that something that's still under consideration or just don't remember what the status of it is? Hey, I can speak to that if you want to, Tom. Um, I, I had uh, conversations with DOC today uh, just to get an update for our meeting. They're still talking to Amherst Inspection Services, but we anticipate approval pretty quickly. Um, every, everything looks like it's falling into place. Great. Thanks, Mark. Okay. That was uh, all my questions and comments. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Chris, did you have a comment? Yeah, Chris, I Chris, spoke Chris? with I spoke with the building commissioner about the use of that house at 211 South Pleasant Street today, and he said that it can be approved as a construction uh, and accessory construction use for an educational use. 
under Article 14. So unlike um, 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street, where that had to come before the planning board for use of an adjacent parcel for construction, staging, and an office, um, in this case, it can be approved under Article 14, and the building commissioner seems inclined um, to approve it. So I think that's going to go ahead. OK. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Janet. Um, I had a few questions or issues. Um, one of them was, and I asked this <clears throat> yesterday, was you're in the RG and you're building a building of you know X square feet um, with you know three stories. How many parking spaces are you required to provide? Just uh, like so. I understand, your, I understand your like concept of yourself as sort of you know a campus, but if you know you're in the RG and you're required to put in X amount of parking spaces, so did someone do that calculation? Um, yeah, based on the the zoning requirements, it's approximately forty five spaces would be associated with this use in that zone. Okay, um, and so the so that that's um, I think you need to get a waiver for that, or we need to talk about that sort of separately, because you're adding more spaces to this other um, building, but you're not adding 45. So I think that's an issue that we need to address. In very particular, I feel like there, and then of those 44, 45 spaces, I'm not sure how many need to be ADA compliant, but I would think at least two or three. Um, so I haven't done that calculation. I was hoping to find that somewhere in the report um, or get that information, but I really do think, um, the distance from if you were a person who had trouble mobility or even sight, that's a really long way to go from the dorm all the way down the wooded path to um, get into the, you know, to the, to the side of the building and getting around to the front. And so I would really like to see, you know, at least two, maybe three ADA spaces right next to the building for visitors or professors or staff or students who have trouble with mobility. Um, I just think it's way too far to expect anybody. And, you know, I, I, I speak from a lot of experience of having, you know, walked along with somebody with a walker. That's a really long way. And then Andrew yesterday was having trouble getting around a short distance. So I think that's that to me was a big kind of jump out that there's not spaces right next to the building that people can get access to it. Um, although I do appreciate the hearty walking of the Amherst College professors. Um, so that was one big issue. Um, the second one was I couldn't read the lighting plan. Like I tried everything I could to see the detail on it. I couldn't find a single number. I had some magnifying glass. You know, I put on extra readers and I just could never see that. So I, I think that it would be good to see the lumens. And um, I couldn't see it on the, the computer today, even though I tried to get it bigger. So I just couldn't read it at all. Um, and and. I also am very like, I think, I'm not sure if this building has changed its appearance or if I have changed, because when I first saw it nine months ago, I was like, hmm, not that interesting, but I do think it seems beautiful to me. And it, I love all the light in the glass and it's very different from the building it is now connected to, but it's, it's very, it's much more attractive than I thought nine months ago or else it's changed or some way. So I just wanted to make that comment. Um, another comment I have is, I wonder if the plantings along the street are too different from the street itself. Um, like the grasses, it doesn't, it doesn't, I know the building that you're building isn't like a New England style, but people are going to come along and see a lot of shrubs and, you know, the traditional stuff kind of have this, you know, brief moment of grasses and, you know, very regimented plantings, and then they're going to go back to the other thing. And I just wondered, does that kind of work or does that seem sort of strange to people? And I would defer to the landscape architects on the panel um, about their thoughts. So those are my big three comments. Parking, um, like I can't see the lighting plan, and then um, just wondering about the plantings being too inconsistent from the rest of the the rest of the street. All right, thank you, Janet. Um, Andrew, since she referred to the landscape architects on the board, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll put you on the spot at least for that third point of Janet's, and relative to the consistency. That's the way I interpreted it, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that from a consistency perspective, the street front with the street trees is 
will will maintain um, a consistent feel along South Pleasant Street. And I, I think that the the nature of the kind of the oval is like 50 or 60 feet off of the street, off of the sidewalk. I think it's going to feel something that's part of the Lyceum and not part of the streetscape. Um, I, I think it I think it's done quite well. Yeah, I think I think the garden looks really good. I was just thinking about just along the street with the grasses in front of the buildings. And this is the grasses that were disguising the big retaining wall. Yeah, and I, part of it looks like you're you're landscaping for low maintenance, you know, like you know, things that you don't have to trim every 15 minutes, but I just wondered if it just seems too different or, you know, but the the the, the entire garden swale area just seems beautiful to me also. Yeah, I mean, I would say also currently in front of 197 now is kind of tall grasses. Uh, it's kind of the existing conditions are already similar to that. Um, okay. Okay, thank you, Janet. Uh, Chris, Chris Prestra. You're calling on me to comment I on am. the planting? Yeah, you have your hand up. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I don't. I didn't mean to. That's <laughs> okay. a legacy. All right, so Andrew, we're back to you. Um, I, I had different questions. Did did the panel or did folks want to answer Janet's first? Okay. Yeah. So well, um, regarding the ADAs, you know, the number of spaces, the number of total parking spaces. Right. So um, I guess I'll put in two points and then I'll, I'll defer to um, to Lauren in terms of uh, what's feasible uh, in site. Um, in the development report, and I think this was reflected in the application, we do note that, that we need a waiver for parking. Um, so that that is accounted for. I agree that that is something that the board needs to take action on. Um, if there were 45 spaces provided, um, my my memory of the code, which is always a dangerous thing, would be that there'd be two um, ADA spaces required associated with that. Thank you. Um, Could you put those two spaces close to the building, maybe where the, sh the trees are, or um, reconfigure that? I'd, I'd like to talk to parking in general because I, I think that this is a, um, it's difficult to, um, I think, conceptualize of the, of the fact that this is a building on a college campus as opposed to a building, you know, we're, we're talking about this building in isolation. And so it, it's tough to zoom out. Um, so, you know, we've, we've talked about the fact that, that the parking facility for the campus is all of the parking on the campus. There is no designation. There is no, uh, you know, people coming to this building are gonna park in a certain area. It, it is uh, a system with uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of parking spaces distributed around, um, you know, to the south of this, there's a, a large lot at the uh, athletics area, it wraps all around the athletics drive, obviously. Um, there are a number of, of uh, lots of, of uh, larger than the one at Newport that are kind of scattered up uh, around uh, north of this building. On the other side of Northampton Road, there's a, a you know 150 spots or whatever it is at Converse. Uh, you know it's it's part of a system. So um, we do not view any building as having parking of its own per se. Um, you know if this was Chapin Hall. Uh, you know, on the, in, on the middle of the campus, which is about the same size. Chapin's, you know, a little larger than this, or maybe it's about the same size. I picked that because that's where the, the, the history department is located now. You know, there's no parking. Um, and so uh, it's just a fact of life, uh, of college life, that uh, parking is not provided at buildings, uh, you know, with, with some exceptions, just by ha happenstance, really. And when it comes to accessibility, we really go out of our way to provide accessible spaces um, where, they're, where they're needed. And so we worked hard to get a uh, fully compliant accessible space right at the building here, despite the challenges associated with all the topography. Um, you know, the reality is that that, that's, that space is really, really important, but it'll be empty 95% of the time. And that's fine, it, that's, you know, it needs to be that way. Um, we have a, a fully accessible route 
that connects to the parking lot at Newport where there'll be additional fully compliant accessible spaces, which also generally will be uh, unused, but that, you know, that's, that's, that's a good thing. They're available when they're needed. Um, so we feel very, very confident that um, from kind of the, the, uh, the, the functional, um, the, um, the practical uh, side of it, you know, what's necessary and what's, what, what is um, important to provide for the users to satisfy the need, uh, and also from kind of any, any moral perspective, we think that this is uh, very adequate in addressing that. Accessibility is a, a high priority for the college. We're making, you, you would probably all know this from other hearings, we're making significant strides in, in improving accessibility uh, left, right and center around the campus with a, a um, annual allocation associated for that and uh, a number of projects every year, um, probably most of which don't come before the planning board. Uh, but uh, you know, that, that, that is a, uh, an ongoing priority for the college and so, um, I just want to just kind of speak to the logic behind why there aren't three spaces at the building, uh, and, you know, and, 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 you know, and there's uh, one fully accessible space at the building and others nearby. Doug, could I have a follow-up question and a comment? Sure, Janet. So um, I think that, I think I, I don't, I'm not going to die on the sword of the 45 spaces because I understand your point that this is a college and um, every building doesn't have to meet our code. Um, and so I do think that's a, there's an adequate number of spaces, but I do think that if you, I think having two accessible spaces on the corner of um, College Street and I, I can't remember the name of the road, Wood something, um, is really not accessibility to that building. And so I, I if you, I would, would like to see a condition to have at least two spaces next to the building. Um, you know, that's a long way to go in a wheelchair or a walker or, you know, I, it's just a really long way to go. And so that would be really important to, to have enough space there. And I, it looks like you could move a tree or two or a shrub and find that. Um, the other question, the question I do have though, is if you were a visitor to that building, could you park in the lot near the dorm and walk up there or is there is there some sort of special arrangement for visitors because i'm sure you'll have speakers and things like that like or would they be directed somewhere else or would they know where to go um so we don't have any kind of um allocation of parking um that, that's allocated for any you know the president doesn't have a parking space you know we're we're, mm -hmm. we're pretty unusual in that regard i think um for colleges but uh but that's just how we are um, so the way that that's handled is um, if there's going to be a, a VIP showing up to give a talk or something like that, um, they'll arrange it to put a cone out and, and preserve a spot and that, you know or have communication to that person to say, hey, there's going to be a cone in, in a, a parking lot for uh, over in this location and, and you can move that and park there. That, that's just how, how it's been done. All right, thanks, Tom. Uh, uh, Chris, does anybody from your team want to talk about the lighting levels? Since since I agree with Janet, they were basically indecipherable. Nate may want to talk about it. I think he's studied it pretty closely and he's had conversations with um, Chris Chamberlain about it. So you might want to call on Nate. All right, well, either Chris or Nate, I don't, doesn't matter. Sure, I'll, I'll make something up. The, um, no, I think the, the you know, they've, the, there's five um, types of lighting. Uh, there's pole lights, which, you know, according to the spec sheets were, um, you know, 19, almost 20 feet tall. There's, um, you know, uh, wall lighting, like Lauren mentioned, and then there's building lighting and then bollards along the walkways. And so, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a low light um, scheme. So nothing's too bright. Uh, you know, the lighting along the path is, you know, something that meets standards for like a garden walk, um, you know, or walkways. You know, this isn't a high residential or urban street. So along the South Plaza, along the building, those two main walkways leading up to it, it's, it's you know, it's well lit. Um, you know, it's not as well lit in, in the South Lawn, right? So um, for functions at night, you know, the lighting is really on circulation paths and along the building to illuminate you know, the building and, you know, probably for security reasons. So 
I think it's, um, you know, a respectful lighting plan. So it's not a glaring lighting plan, right? It's not, the whole site's not illuminated at night. It's not in the urban core of the campus or in a downtown. So, um, you know, right along that south entrance and those walkways, it's, it's you know, the, the lighting, the lumens that are shown here, the numbers meet the, you know, the standards are of, um, of lighting. All right, thanks, Nate. Uh, Chris, did you want to, Chris uh, Chamberlain, did you want to add anything? Um, I don't think we have too much to add. Um, I know that that Christopher from Bruner Cott, um, you know, circled back with our lighting consultant uh, to verify a few of the questions that came through Nate's comments. Uh, I think he summarized it really well, is um, there's, there's a tendency to think that more light is better sometimes uh, for safety, but uh, in, when you talk about glare and certain settings that are in the existing condition, low light, um, just enough light is typically better than too much. Um, and that's what we've really gone for. And, and I, I admit that, that it is hard to see uh, on the electronic version. It is uh, possible to zoom in and, and get a better view of some of these numbers. Uh, but generally speaking, those paths are, are seeing, as you can see here, uh, this is pretty representative, is you've got... Uh, between, you know, mostly clustered around one and two foot candles um, on the site. All right, thank you. Uh, Tom, Tom Long. Thanks, Doug. And um, thanks guys for your presentation. Um, I think a lot of my questions were already asked, but I, I just wanted to chime in on a couple of things really quick. Um, one is that I think the aesthetic is right on with what, what Amherst has been doing over the years in terms of um, keeping their um, architecture in a, let's say a, a contemporary fashion for that time, um, but in a, a nice pairing with its history um, and the historic buildings on the site. So um, I appreciate where this building is coming from, where it's headed. Um, I wanted to also, um, another point, comment that I support the, uh, waiver on the setback. Um, I think that having that building flush with the existing building is the appropriate thing to do in this particular case. Um, I think it does help reinforce that street front um, and, and I'm okay with that um, revision. I think in terms of parking, I did teach at Amherst for about 10 years and you just kind of park somewhere and then you walk, like what's the closest building and you have guests come all the time and you send them a campus map and you tell them, that spot's the closest if you could find one, but otherwise you'll find your way. Um, but I do hear you in terms of accessibility, Janet. I do see that there is one spot and then there's a drop off. So there is the possibility of um, if someone is with another person to be dropped off in that location at the site and then the car can be parked elsewhere. So I think that's adequate for the, the particular um, purposes on the site as well. Um, there is a loop across the street by the gym. Um, that's actually a place where I would commonly park to go all the way up to Sealy Mud. Um, but that's actually, um, there's a lot of turnover there. It's easy to park there and it's literally um, not that far. So yeah, right around that loop. Um, yeah, as you get towards the top of that loop, it'll come out to South Pleasant. And uh, the, the site is here for reference. Yeah, it's not super far either, um, given, given campus walks. Um, and then I, I do agree about lighting. I do have a concern, um, not so much about the general lighting, um, but about the path, path in the woods uh, lighting and um, for safety concerns. I'm wondering if there is a, um, a safety pylon or uh, emergency call button or something in that long walk through the woods from a dorm building to a public building. I'm wondering what light levels are there how much space there is between, because I don't see any renderings of that space. So are there places to hide? I'm just, I'm not sure what that experience is like. So I'm just, um, I have a concern for safety in that particular place. That's all. Thanks, Tom. Tom Davies, do you want to respond to any of yeah. that? Um, I, I, we, we might be getting a little bit tripped up by the, by the uh, you know, the poetic naming of it as Woodland Pathway. Um, it's really a sidewalk. Uh, it is um, relatively flat. There's not much grade, um, you know, from one end to the other. Uh, and, it, and it's running through what shows here are canopy trees. Uh, of course, in an aerial view like that, you know, you see the canopy. 
but when you're walking through the space, you see the trunks of the trees. So there's there's not a lot of undergrowth. It's uh, a fairly open. There you go. Uh, it's a it's a pretty open space. Um, walking through there. Uh, that said, safety obviously is a primary concern for the college for uh, for students, faculty, and staff, and visitors. Um, and uh, lighting needs to be appropriate. Um, so we're, we're certainly committed to uh, appropriate lighting levels, um, whatever that means. And we rely on experts that are lighting designers to, to design that for us. So I'll defer to them. Um, but I did wanna just mention one thing about the, um, the um, blue light, emergency lights. Um, I'm pretty sure we do not have anything involved here. Is that correct, Mark? Um, and and the, um, the reason for that is that because uh, the college really has been, is, has been getting away from them. They're, they're never used. Um, everyone has an emergency phone in their pocket. Uh, and so um, the, the use of those blue light emergency phone things is really um, fading away on college and university campuses. Um, so th that's why you don't see it here. You know, 10 years ago, absolutely, it would be um, part of this plan. You know, we had a, a plan to, to have them kind of always within um, eyesight of the next one kind of a thing, um, but we've really stepped away from that in the last mm, at least five years. I think, I think that view that you um, shared of the forest um, was helpful in terms of seeing how open it was. So I think it's just helpful for me to see that. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tom. Uh, Janet. So getting back to handicap spaces, is there space in that back area that you could put another space if you move things around? Because I, I do see the three trees or shrubs planted there. And I know you have, you know, you have some dumpsters and things like that, but I do think it's not really accessible if someone has to drop you off. There has to be someone to drop you off and then find a parking space. You know, I just think that I think I would just like to see two spaces there. Um, but it it looks like there's space to me because I'm looking at some plantings and I wondered, could you do that? Could you fit that in there if you move the plantings or things around a little bit? Not if you want to, but could you do that? Is that a question for Lauren? Tom, is that okay if I answer this? It it's a little bit it's a little bit difficult, Janet. Only because we need this. Um, I'm just going to draw here. It's a little bit difficult in this location. We'd have to study it further, but you need this turnaround. So when the car pulls in, you need to turn around to be able to get out. So we it's not as easy as just putting another space here and paving this because there's no place for it to turn around. The car would have to back all the way down. Um, so I think it's a really good point and I think we will certainly talk further about this. But to answer your question, it's not as simple as just paving that location. All right, thanks, Lauren. Yep. Uh, Janet, are you maintaining your hand for further questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Maria. So I think this was brought up a while ago and it kind of, you just said, uh, oh, it might have been the last time Tom Davies was at the planning board meeting where we were saying, well, could we one day relook at all the college properties and think about what currently is an RG should go over to ED? Yeah, because it's been like that for decades. And maybe it was you, Doug, that brought that up. And I remember Tom was like, oh my gosh, you know, jumped on it. And and the 44 parking spaces or however many spaces requirement is because of an antiquated zoning that's just been around and the campus, the college has grown into the adjacent zone. So to use that as the number to go by to uh, figure out the number of parking spaces, the number of ADA spaces seems uh, outdated as well because this is an ED building in an RG zone, you know, it, the zone doesn't really match what the use of that parcel has been for the last, uh, I don't know how many decades. So I, I feel like that conversation is not really the right sort of big picture conversation to have. I think that it's more like, how is this building used? Um, how will it be used? Are there 
things provided that um, are taking into account those possible scenarios. And I think they are just like we were saying about the drop off and the fact that there is one right next to the building and that there are times when you can pull up into other side streets and be closer to the building if you can't get right up to that loading zone ADA space. So I feel like, you know, if you step back and look at the whole, like, why is this an RG versus ED, that kind of makes the whole, you know, calculation moot in a way. So um, I, I wanted to say this earlier when we were talking about the woodland sidewalk, but I wonder if there's enough lighting to make sure we there aren't you can cite or spot the moose walks that go through that property. I know that that's been an issue in the past. And then um, what was the other thing? Something about lighting. Um, hmm. No, oh, I lost it. That's all right. Anyways, um, yeah, I, I don't, I personally don't think that we need two ADA spaces right up against the building when, you know, that, that property is already very tight. They've done so much work with the grading and getting all the site slopes to work with the entrances and as far as people and cars. I just, I feel like more paving is not the right place, right sort of direction for this project. Um, maybe it'll come to me. I forgot what my other point was from an earlier question, but that's all right, but that's it. All right, thanks, Maria. I, I guess I'm I'm going to make one comment about that, and I I don't think I would use the RG requirement as the basis for that conversation. Um, I I wonder what the expected occupancy of the building is, uh, kind of on in, you know in the mid mid morning on a class day. Um, you know, is it you know if there's a class going on, are there seventy people in the building or are there forty? Um, Anybody have a sense of that? I, I think those are both good guesses, Doug. Um, <laughs> the um, you know the class schedule has peaks and valleys. Um, so on a Monday through Thursday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., um, there there could be 70 people in the building. There could be 100 people in the building. Um, uh, you know, of course, all pedestrians. Um, but uh, I think that you know how, how it's, many it's of those to, are tough to guess. Are likely to be staff. What, what's the oh. tip, typical staff occupancy? Uh, I think there are only two staff members. There are uh, two uh, administrative people: one associated with the history department, and one associated with the Center for Humanistic Inquiry. Um, the the number of faculty is uh, Mark. You have that off the top of your head? Fifteen. Something like yeah, that, but uh, of course, they're you know, don't I didn't say this. They're, they're, they're rarely in their offices, right? That's you know. so. There's so there's maybe at, at most there would be. I mean, if they were all there, I mean, there would be maybe twenty staff and faculty. Yeah. Okay. So I'm. Um, you know, I, I I will say the older you get, the more likely it is that you're going to have temporary mobility issues, you know, you can twist your ankle and then for six weeks need to, you know, have some trouble. Um, I assume, Tom, uh, you have some sort of, uh, I, I wouldn't call it a program, but a, a an approach to how uh, students with mobility issues are supported in their movement around campus. Yeah. Um, whether that's golf carts or, you know, where they're assigned for their dorms or, you know, all of the above. Yeah. Um, and maybe all, you, all of the above, you, yeah. you even move classes if, you know, you have somebody who need, has a particular need in the class. Yeah. Um, so I'm less worried about students and, but faculty and staff, I could imagine, you know, maybe there would be times where you need where two people in the building need assistance, either getting from their remote parking lot or they need a close location. Yeah. So I guess uh, I think Janet's concern is, is, is reasonable, but I assume you, you may have this same issue on multiple locations on campus and that you, you have some way of dealing with it that doesn't run afoul of the federal ADA legislation and um, doesn't keep your 
staff and faculty from quitting. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, ha we actually have a, a, um, a transport system um, that is on call and has an accessible van. Uh, and so that is available to the entire college community. Um, and uh, they think they just got a new van, uh, you know, with the, with the side that drops down uh, with a kind of a elevator, kind of a lift thing built into it. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's uh, you know, something that you just see around campus and, um, you know, used for getting people to athletic events across campus or whatever the, the, the case might be. All right, uh, Janet. So this just occurred to me as a question for Chris Brestrup. Is there some kind of requirement that handicapped spaces be some distance from the building they're associated with? Is is, I mean, like 250 feet seems really far to me. Um, I, I think it's actually longer. I can't remember. But is there some kind of federal or state requirement that it has to be within 20 feet or 25 feet? Or is there? I don't know the answer to that. Maybe. Thanks, Janet. Chris supposed to be within 200 feet of the handicapped entrance. And I think Nate figured out that this space that's provided next to the building is within 200 feet of the entrance. All right, thank you. Uh, Janet, your hand is a legacy now. Oh, well, I mean, I meant the spaces that were at the dorm. There's a couple of handicapped oh. spaces. Oh, at they're, the they're probably well in excess of, of the 200 feet. Okay. Uh, well, let's see, not seeing other hands, I'm going to just ask a few questions. Um, am I right about, could, could somebody just draw on, say, this plan, what the route is from the accessible spot that's uh, on the west side of the building to the, uh, the nearest accessible entry? Is it around on the south side of the building or is it on the west side? Uh, I'm going to... Perfect. Okay. All right. So that's the distance that's probably less than 200 feet. And I haven't opened up my packet to see, is there a door at the hammerhead there on the uh, west side of the building? So there's no, no entry there. Okay. So Doug, quickly on the plans, you'll see um, on the concrete ramp, there's a, there is a door. Um, on the west side, it's probably an exit only because uh, there's a landing inside. So, um, all right, where the cursor is, there um, just about there's a door, and then there's a service entrance on the north side. So there are, you know, uh, if you look at the plan, there are entries, but they're not, you know, to for you know visitors or students or anything. So that's right. I I can speak to this briefly. So the one that I'm circling right now, this is for access to the mechanical room which is actually at a different level than the first floor and then there's another one at the bottom of stair two and this is egress only so exit only uh, through that and, and, and on this plan north is up which is yeah. rotated from the site plans yeah so the exit from <clears throat> stair two is the, is on the west side of the building yeah okay um has this uh project needed historic commission review and did it receive it? Chris, press trip. Yes, this did receive historic commission review. Um, there was an addition to the existing brick building on the south side of the building and also an addition on the west side. And the historical commission looked at um, the removal of both of those items. And they also talked to the applicant about the proposed plan. So um, the, the Historical Commission is aware of this proposal and has approved the removal of those two additions to the building. I'm not sure what the conversation was about changing to changes to the facade on the west and south side, but perhaps um, Tom Davies or uh, Chris Chamberlain could talk about that. Okay, Tom or Chris? Chris, either of you want to say anything? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, I, I didn't catch the question. Uh, Chris, could you repeat that? Yeah, the question is, um, did Amherst College talk to the Historical Commission about 
in addition to removing the white structures that were on the south and the west side of the building, did you talk to the Historical Commission about changing changes to the facade of the existing building? In other words, the brick um, facades on the south and west sides, and what was that conversation like? Um, I don't recall anything along those lines, Chris, but um, anybody else on the team recall anything along those lines? I, I don't, I don't okay. think so. Chris, so this would, Chris, yeah. this would simply be a conversation about the fact they are now interior spaces, interior surfaces, and are now not visible. Yeah, so the, so I can speak quickly, Doug, the, you know, there is, um, three demolition applications for this project. There was the removal of the house at 205 South Pleasant Street, which has since been removed. So that, that satisfied the demolition request there. There's a barn on the property where the parking lot is being proposed. And the commission um, found that that removal was, um, you know, the barn is, has some powder post beetle and other deterioration. So they, they voted to allow that demolition and then at a later date, there was a demolition application just for the, you know, the house, the brick house. And they found that, um, you know, the, the removal of the deck in the uh, Western addition was, um, you know, that could move forward. And, you know, typically the commission does not look what, what's happening in its place unless, you know, there's possibly some, some other demolition to the structure. So, you know, they're aware that there was going to be a new building um, connected to the house and they didn't find any you know, any, you know, any reason to put conditions or delay, you know, that demolition work because of the proposed addition. Okay, thank you. Chris, I assume, Chris Brestrup, I assume your hand is now a legacy. Oh, sorry. Got to keep on top of that. All right. So my next question had to do with the pedestrian traffic across the street, across uh, 116. Is this uh, the first academic building on the west side of of 116, or do we already have students crossing for classes on a regular basis? Yeah, it, the latter. Um, we have a, a couple of, of uh, buildings on the west side, uh, starting up at the north corner is College Hall, um, that has um, you know uh, students going there for financial matters and whatnot. But more importantly, the whole first floor is the career center, so students are going back and forth that out all the time. Um, the next building south from that is Morgan Hall, which is an academic building. A um, couple of different departments there, classrooms uh, there. Um, the President's House, even though it's called the President's House, it's, it's used for other um, functions. So um, faculty and staff uh, primarily, but occasionally students going um, to events there. Um, and then of course the whole uh, athletic complex um, further to the, to the west. Um, uh -huh. And uh, so, so yes, we do have people going back and forth um, from the from the kind of the core of the campus. You know, if you were to say, you know, if someone's coming from say Frost Library, um, they they would be using the crosswalks at at uh, the Quadrang Quadrangle Drive there. You know, up near the President's House, there are two crosswalks there um, from you know the athletic space and from. Um, the Greenway dorms further to the, the east of those um, students would would uh, most likely be yeah coming across at Walnut Street. So there are you know three different ways to get across. Of course the the, the slope of the hill between those crossings is super steep. So we do not imagine any kind of problem with students kind of cutting across the hillside and dropping down that embankment. It's just it's too steep even for students. Um, which is saying a lot, um, but it, it, we're, we're not seeing any, uh, we're not imagining any, any kind of problem with that. All right, great. So my next question had to do with the stormwater as, as dealt with on the, on the Lyceum site. I know in, in uh, Chris Chamberlain's summary, uh, you mentioned that the, some of the stormwater provisions up at the north end, uh, we're compensating, let's say, for the work that's happening down at the south end around the Lyceum. But since I think the slope is to the south off of the Lyceum site, I just wanted to be sure you've, you're, conf, you're con confident that we're not going to be creating new runoff issues 
toward uh, Walnut Street. Maybe Chris Chamberlain, do you have any comment about the stormwater design for the southern part of the? Yeah, I, I started to answer and then realized I was on mute, sorry. Oh, good, um, all right. Yes, and you know, uh, I'll note that while there is an increase in impervious area in the core site, um, replacing two houses and a driveway and a barn, it's it's not as much as you would think looking at this site. Um, but yes, we we um, did look at uh, concerns on on the sort of distribution of stormwater between Walnut and Woodside, um, and sort of uh, um, noted those uh, in our. Uh, submission to DPW, um, and it's comparable enough that that we're not concerned. And uh, the the storm drains in both of these streets do meet up um, very quickly um, at this intersection here. Um, and you know, I'll just note that that uh, there were no concerns on DPW's part um, in their comments on it. Okay. All right, so at, at the worst, uh, your abutter can take care of that problem. Yes. Okay. Um, and then um, I guess I was, I'm just interested in, in the rationale on the expansion of the parking lot. Um, you know, at the north end, I, I'm forgetting the name of that parcel, but, um, you know, if you're saying, there's no net demand increase for the campus because the people that are going to work in this new building are already working on campus. But you are increasing the size of your built foot of your of your space on campus and presumably the people that are going to move into this building are going to be uh, vacating space somewhere else on campus which might receive new people. So I'm just uh, I'm curious why why was this the time to expand this parking lot if in fact there's really no change in demand? Hey Tom, um, the um, the the uh, how do I say this? Politics is is the is actually the, the, you know the honest answer. Um, the um, the folks uh, who are moving to this site. You know, felt that they, they there was actually um, uh, requests for considerably more parking. You, you'll be shocked to hear this, I'm sure. Um, there was a request for considerably more parking proximate to the to the building, uh, and it was uh, kind of scaled back to, well, let's just work with the parking that's there, clean it up a little bit, get a few more spaces out of it, and and that'll help. So that's kind of how, how this came down. Okay. To, to the point where we actually did look at parallel spaces on this incredibly yeah. steep driveway in order to <laughs> offer, no. offer something. Okay, all right. Uh, that's all that I had for the moment, at least. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. I, had, I just had one other related question to the ADA piece. Um, so, Tom, you mentioned that right now you can cross South Pleasant at Quadrangle, at Walnut Street, and then by the athletic fields. Do you think, I, I know that Quadrangle leads to a staircase. Do you think someone from a wheelchair, if they crossed at Walnut, would be able to go up the sidewalk and access the building? Since it sounds like Woodside is too steep for someone to be able to take a wheelchair up. So, could somebody approach a building from a non motorized wheelchair reasonably if there wasn't? Uh, an available like drop off for them. Um, so, uh, sorry, I, I just wanted to be clear that the, the pathway connecting over to Newport is fully accessible. It's it's quite quite level. Um, so access from that from you know from the accessible parking spaces at, at the Newport lot are definitely available to somebody in a motorized or unmotorized wheel, you know, wheelchair. Um, but the, the, um, the issue of uh, accessibility from the, the rest of the campus, first of all, we, we are uh, creating an accessible pathway that adds to our overall network. Um, we didn't talk about this because it's not part of this, this purview here, but um, it, it kind of 
uh, runs along the side of the um, uh, athletics loop drive uh, and connects in with the rest of the accessible um, pathways. Okay, we're, it's coming up here. You're still on my screen anyway, you're pointing to something that, that you're not needing to point to, but okay, now it's catching up. Um, yeah, so, so um, connecting to the whole accessible network pathway to get someone um, with mobility impairments to South Pleasant Street and to that crosswalk all along accessible pathways from the rest of the campus. Now, the, the way that things work um, is that uh, municipal sidewalks uh, don't have the same requirements uh, of accessibility. You probably all know that. Um, and so there is a, a little situation there where at that crossing, where it kind of goes down and then comes back up again. Um, we've had, we started to have conversations and they haven't really moved very far yet to try to improve that. Um, the primary reason that we were looking for an additional crossing was to make a fully accessible pathway from the college's network of fully accessible pathways to the fully accessible pathways that we're building as part of this project. That was the primary motivator, not you know, because we need another place to cross the road. Um, and the hope is that we can make some, working with the town, make some adjustments to the municipal sidewalk at that intersection that, uh, for the existing crossing to improve it so that it is more accessible. Long-winded answer. I, I don't know, I, I obviously it's very difficult. I don't know the, the challenges of getting that new crosswalk approved, so. Um, I, I feel for you. That does, certainly does seem like that would answer a great deal of the question, because uh, then I think you know it, you could very, very, uh, you could very realistically say it's the access is at least similar to other buildings on campus. I think just right now, it's it's not, and and that's why I think you know the the, the request and ask for investigating a second ADA spot seems seems reasonable if these are the circumstances that we're operating on. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Janet? Um, I just remembered something from the site visit, and I think it's an issue um, in, terms, in terms of the construction. Um, we talked about um, how you know, construction vehicles will get onto the site and get off the site. And um, I forget, I think it was Mark Andrews was there, and I think he's in discussions with um, Rob Mora about having um, the construction vehicles come from 116 and also exit that way, um, which seemed preferable to me, at least because it's a main road. And I just wanted to say that was a question that was raised. And I, I wonder if there's, you know, from Mark, if there's any more progress on that, because it seemed to me like having the, the exit of large vehicles, you know, over months onto a small residential street would be a little burdensome to the, the residents. Sure, sure. So it's it's a little bit of a chicken and egg, um, and and what allows us to bring um, the large uh, construction, the large heavy trucks on from one sixteen and, and push them back onto one sixteen is not having the office trailer there. So as soon as we get green lighted to use two eleven South Pleasant, then we can implement that plan. Thanks, Mark. All right, do we have any more questions from the board? All right, why don't we go and see if there are any questions or comments from the public? This is the time for public comment on this Amherst College project. I do not see any hands from the public. Um, Chris, uh, you had put together some draft findings and uh, maybe conditions. Do you want to share those at this time, Chris Brestrup? Chris, you are muted. Yeah. Um, so we can go through the uh, conditions, the draft conditions that I have for the Lyceum project, if you would like to do that. And then I have also conditions for um, the Newport project. And Pam, can you bring them 
up on the screen. I think I emailed them to you. You did, and I'm gonna see if I can get them on my screen. Uh, okay, can you see them? Yes, that's great. Yeah, why don't you blow them up to maybe 130% or something? Oops. There, that's, well, that's plenty, yep. Okay, good. Can you see the whole document? Because I can't, you guys no, are- We can no. see the first three items. There, that's that's about that half better? a page. Yeah. Okay. So um, I drafted these conditions based on conditions that we've put on similar size projects. And then I asked Rob Mora to review um, the conditions and also uh, Nate reviewed the conditions. So this is what we came up with. Um, <clears throat> number one, I'm going through general conditions now. The development shall be built substantially in accordance with the plan submitted to the planning board and approved on X date. Uh, the development shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on X date, whatever date that was for approval. Number three, changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plans or to the exterior of the building shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change and or to determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the special permit or site plan review approval. Number four, landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscape plan prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy and once installed shall be continually maintained. All disturbed areas shall be loamed and seeded unless otherwise specified. Number five, the building shall meet all local required energy efficiency codes and the regulations of the stretch energy code. In addition, low flow plumbing uh, fixtures shall be installed throughout the project. Number six, this site plan review, uh, excuse me, what a, uh, approval shall expire within two years of the date that it is filed with the town clerk, unless it has been both recorded at the registry of deeds and substantial construction or use has commenced within the two year period. Construction shall be completed within 24 months from the date of issuance of the building permit. If more time is needed, the applicant shall come before the planning board at a public meeting for re a review and approval of an extension of time. Uh, Chris, can I ask yeah. you about number four? Mm -hmm. yep. um, I know that there are times when uh, you, you might want to wait to install some of your landscape plantings so that they are more likely to survive. Mm -hmm. um, Amherst College, do you have any problem with this? I don't know exactly what your schedule is and whether you're, for instance, looking for a certificate of occupancy in, in June or July when you might want to wait until the fall to plant. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great point, Doug. And um, if everything goes according to plan, we will be looking at a certificate of occupancy kind of the other way around, um, maybe counterintuitively, but we're gonna be looking for a certificate of occupancy in um, July, August, and we'll, we will not wanna do a uh, majority of the plantings until the fall. So Mr. Uh, Mora, the building commissioner has been known to grant um, temporary certificate of occupancy or yeah, I think that's what he calls it. Um, so that if everything isn't completed, but he feels like you're well on your way to completing things, um, he can issue a temporary certificate of occupancy, allowing you to move into the building without having everything completely done. And right. that's and, and a conversation Chris, that you work out with him. And Chris, you, you think he would rather do that than have this read that, you know, the landscaping needs to be installed within four months of the C of O being issued? It's harder to chase that. Yeah. So I think if the, if the applicant is really eager to get the C of O, they'll get the landscaping in, you know, in a timely manner, or they'll work out a, a deal with the uh, building commissioner about the 
about the timing and about a temporary certificate of occupancy. But if we have to chase them, it's it's more difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Go ahead. On building exterior and site improvements. The town engineer and building commissioner shall inspect the construction of the entry driveway and all on site paved areas for conformance to town standards. Number nine, all on site utilities shall be underground. Number 10, all exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant. Exterior lighting shall be downcast, shielded, and shall not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. Completion uh, of Chris? work. You uh, have a I, question? I, 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 sorry, I'm feeling like asking you questions at the end of each section here. Oh, that's fine. Uh, um, number eight, uh, is that all the all paved areas, even those off of the public property? Yes. And and do we have why would why would town standards apply to a sidewalk on Amherst College property? It's in the um, section seven that talks about, well, this is particularly for drive driveways and parking. So it would apply to the driveway and it would apply to any place where vehicles are moving around. Um, okay. Yes, I need to look at section seven. Thank there you. are specific uh, um, details about how, how paving is built for driveways. Okay. Um, completion of work, the applicant shall provide as built plans that show building location, grades, access ways, sidewalks, and walkways, curbing, stormwater management facilities, lighting, and utilities to the building commissioner, the town engineer, and to be placed with the site plan review files in the planning offices prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy. Digital CAD plan, number 12, digital CAD plans shall be required for final as-builts for the DPW. These plans shall depict all property lines, pins, easements, and utilities. The utility information shall include rims, inverts, pipe sizes, and slope, all water valves, shut off, water service locations, sewer service locations, and all clean out locations. Now, Doug, you had um, sort of, uh, what should I say, thought that we shouldn't have to go through all of these um, construction related conditions. So if you want to skip them, I think it's okay to skip them. Um, but the building commissioner has looked at them and he thinks they're important. So how would you like to proceed? Um, I'm not gonna drag everyone through them unless there's more support from other members of the board. Anybody object from the board to Not moving on? Them. Okay. Yep. All right, so let's say 13, 14, 15, all the way to 18. Um, so 19 we could read. Um, this may not be applicable given what we've heard tonight from Amherst College. Um, so the board will have to determine what it wants to do about this condition. Um, the building commissioner felt that if Amherst College was not going to um, proceed with the second crosswalk or if the town council didn't um, approve the second crosswalk, then it might be worth it to have Amherst College return to the planning board at a public meeting to discuss issues of safety, access, and connectivity to the project prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy. So these would be things like what um, Andrew was talking about and what Tom Davies was talking about with regard to making the existing crosswalk and its connection um, to the sidewalk be more navigable by someone who is um, has disabilities. So, um, you know, this is in, in light of the fact that the secondary crosswalk may not be built. So you may wanna discuss this a little bit and see if you want to have this condition in here or not, but given what we've heard about the difficulty in, in navigating from the existing crosswalk up to the new building, it may be worth it to have this condition in here. All right, why don't we, well, let's see. I don't know how many more of these there are. It looks like you're about halfway through. Um, are all the rest of these related to construction? Yeah, I think so. 
Um, let's quickly skim through the rest of them. I don't think there are that many. Just. Oh, here's one, 29. Uh, the project site shall be fenced during construction. Do you want to say anything about um, signage that goes on the construction fencing or any other temporary construction signage? Um, often um, contractors will put large, you know, colorful signs on the construction fencing. We've seen that with some of the archipelago projects downtown. So if you wanted to have some control over that type of signage, this would be the place to put it. You would ask to have anything like that come back to you for review and approval. But if you don't care to be uh, getting into that, then, you know, just say that the site should be fenced. Okay, so that's the sec second topic we should come back to. Uh, Tom, do you want to comment on that now? Uh, just uh, truth in advertising, there's already a sign that says DOC. It's probably four feet high and six feet wide on the fence to identify the site to vendors and suppliers. Okay. All right. Why don't we scroll through the rest of these and come back to this and uh, question about the crosswalk. Okay, so keep going, Pam. Um, okay, so number 36 is just acknowledging that Amherst College is um, having ongoing conversations with the use of 211 South Pleasant Street. And you're saying that um, use of the adjacent property shall be subject to conditions provided in Article 14 temporary permit, and then we would fill in whatever permit number um, the building commissioner granted for use of that property. Okay. So. Uh, Chris Chamberlain. Yeah, it looks like 33 is a repeated condition. It's about inspection of the paved areas. That's right. So next 33. Okay. All right. And that is that it? That's it. Yep. All right. So why don't we, board members, uh, how do you want to deal with the second crosswalk? Uh, it sounds like Amherst College would prefer not to, I mean, maybe maybe not prefer is probably not the right word, but uh, at the moment, you're not sure you're going to build that. So do you want Amherst College to come back to talk to you about these issues of access and safety if they definitely decide not to build that second crosswalk, or do you want it just to be left up to them? Right. Janet? So I think this is a hard question because it's about the use of the building and how people get to it safely. Um, and I wonder, um, you know, is if Amherst College is not gonna ask for the crosswalk, we should talk about it and have a good plan in place. Um, if they are gonna ask for it, it still looks like a, a long ways, you know, it's gonna take a while to get to the town council and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like a little bit of a dilemma, but I do think that, um, it sounds like they don't want to ask for it because it's too much of it, whatever. Um, and it, it isn't, I would have a lot of questions about the steepness of that from Walnut Avenue and crossing and where students were coming. So we did talk about that at the site visit. So I'm kind of, I'm not, I'm kind of on, I'm wondering what the Amherst College is thinking. All right. Thank you, Janet. Andrew? Uh, I don't know if, if uh, someone wants to answer Janet's question first or. Uh, well, um, I, I was hoping to get the rest of the board fair. comments about yeah, this. Yeah, no, fair, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I like this provision. I thought kind of what I was hearing from Tom was that um, addressing the Woodside crossing uh, or Walnut crossing, I'm sorry, um, was something that you would consider that, but that the crossing, the new crosswalk was really the more of the, 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 the challenge because there's there's aspects of that that weren't under your control but you know you, you acknowledge if you want to make this work and I, I know that you do and you guys the, the college is working hard to do that so I think it would be a, a reasonable request to have them to come back and discuss with us um, how they think they can address that all right so you'd vote for keeping it in I, I would yes okay um, any other any other comments? Can I, uh, Nate? 
Sure. Yeah. In the town engineer's letter, you know, there was um, some concern about, you know, the, the secondary crosswalk further up the hill, just in terms of stopping distance and sight lines. And, you know, I think it becomes a bigger conversation, um, you know, than what we can deal with tonight. So um, and there's also, uh, if it's not a condition, the planning board also has the ability to, you know, make recommendations if this were to come forward as another project under review by town council. So I think there's, you know, there would be um, time uh, in the future if this were to move forward to provide comments. Mm -hmm. May I just point out that this doesn't um, require approval by the planning board and it doesn't necessarily hold anything up with Amherst College. It's just an opportunity for the planning board and Amherst College to discuss the issue once a decision has been made. All right, Chris, Tom Davies. You are muted. Thank you. Um, I, I, I guess I want to say that um, uh, two things. Uh, one is we're, we're, of course, happy to come back and, and talk about this more. And, and it is our intention to in, improve uh, the uh, connectivity between uh, the two sides of the street. Um, but I, I also wanted to mention, um, because I don't think it came up previously, it, maybe it did when we, we met back in June, but that's a long time ago. And I can't remember. Um, but we are in uh, conversation and um, have been working with a traffic engineer on uh, traffic calming measures for the entire stretch um, from the, you know, the intersection at Northampton Road south down to, you know, where the, the, rail, the rail trail uh, is, because uh, it is, um, it, it, the design of the roadway uh, is, um, I'll say uh, it's not best practice uh, for uh, traffic calm. And so um, related to this is an effort to um, make some changes there that will um, slow traffic down um, through kind of visual, visual cues using best practices. Um, that's not part of this at all, but I figured I'd, I'd mention that because uh, it ties in with the goal of um, making a safer, uh, more pedestrian um, friendly uh, campus connection. All right, thanks, Tom. So uh, I guess we've heard a couple people on the board thinking this was a good provision to keep in. Um, I guess at the moment I'd like to know, actually, Tom, go ahead. Uh, I'm fine keeping it in there. Okay. And I think I am too. Uh, so that's at least four of us that are supporting that. So uh, unless there's strong objection from anyone else, why don't we leave this in for the moment? And it sounds like it's likely we'll have more conversation about this at a future meeting. Um, then we wanted to talk about the signage uh, on the construction fence. Does anybody feel the need to uh, dictate the characteristics of that signage at this time. I'm seeing Andrew shake his head no. Tom shake his head no. Maria no. And I'm probably a no. So Chris, I think we can remove the bracketed red text and just leave number 29 with the single sentence in black. All right, so this was the conditions. Um, Want to go through the um, findings for this yeah. building, the Lyceum? I, guess, I mean, is it is it realistic to think that we're going to get through this tonight and and make an make approve, you know, approve the everything and move on? Well, what you would have to do is um, go through the findings for the Lyceum, then you would go through the conditions of which I, I don't have any, no conditions, but I do have findings for the special permit related to the front setback. And then I have conditions for um, Newport House. Now, if you wanted to um, postpone this discussion to your next meeting, uh, you have another meeting on February 2nd, so we could go through the remainder of these things on February 2nd. Mm -hmm. 
And um, do, is that a fairly full agenda on February 2nd? So far, the only thing you have on that agenda is hearing about the demo delay zoning bylaw from um, Ben. Okay. But we are, you know, we, we have kind of got the solar bylaw lingering in the background and we haven't had a chance to talk to, about that um, yet this year, I guess I could say. Um, um, Amherst College, does it matter particularly to you whether we finish this up tonight or not? It matters greatly, Doug. I'm sorry to say, uh, it matters very significantly. We've got millions of dollars of contract that are being put in place in the very near future, and this matters to us. All right, thanks for that clear expression. Um, yeah, unless the board, uh, Janet. We just, before we move on to, um, I, think, I think if we're gonna go through all the documents, we don't, we're not gonna get to the solar bylaw. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's, that's the, I, even, I agree with you. We're not yeah, going to that tonight. I would like to add a condition of just putting in the second parking space um, because I did, it, it's a requirement state law that there be within 200 feet of the building. So I don't think we can waive that. Um, and I just think we should do it, but you know, otherwise I'm happy to plow on. All right. Um, board members, how do you feel about Janet's almost move that we add a condition for a second <laughs> parking space? I could. Andrew? Yeah, I, I, I would like to know whether it actually can fit. I think Lauren, you said that it's something you could look into. It's not preferred. Um, but I wonder if, you know, something could be added on the, not adjacent to the building, but adjacent to the, the basically third spot out. And if the, the, the trail could just meander a little differently to make it fit, it seems like it's something that probably could um, could at least be researched. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I'd like, I, I would love to kind of see the results of that, I guess. Um, okay. So I, I would be supportive of at least some language that asked them to come back. And uh, I could probably also be supportive of Janice's language as well. All right. Um, other board members, Chris? I was just going to say you could have a, a condition that says that you um, that Amherst College shall study um, of the location of a second parking space and come back and discuss it with you um, at a future date or prior to the issuance of a building permit or something like that. Okay. Um, Tom, Tom Long. I support the investigation, but not a condition. Um, that it has to be built before permit. Okay, so that would be a condition similar to what Chris described that Amherst College shall investigate the possibility of adding a, third, a second accessible space and come back to the board with their findings or something like that. Correct, yes. Whether it can or cannot be done, I just, would love to see that tested. Okay. Um, Janet, do you have a quick thing? I want to pull so, the rest I, of the board. On oh, okay. This. I just wanted to say very quickly, I think they can obviously do it. And I don't think we can, uh, we can't violate state law. And so let's just, let's just say, you know, please do it. So I don't know how we can approve something that's against state law and why we'd want to. Well, can you uh, quote the chapter or verse or guideline or whatever you're citing for the state law? I thought that that's what um, Nate had said and Kat and Christine had said. Um, um, I'm not, I'm may, Chris, may I say something? Um, like, so if you're, if you're providing parking at a site, then you have to provide handicap parking. But in this case, they're not providing parking at the site. So they're voluntarily providing a handicapped space at this particular site. So I don't think they're actually required to provide two parking spaces adjacent to the site. I think it's kind of a bonus that they're providing one parking space adjacent to the site. If they were providing a parking lot adjacent to the site, then they you know, potentially have to follow the state law. That's my understanding. Okay. Uh, Nate, did you have a comment? 
No, I was going to, I mean, Chris said it, I spoke with the building commissioner and there is no requirement, um, as she said. So what they're providing is, you know, exceeds the requirement. So, you know, if they did have a parking space um, or a parking lot, they would have to meet, you know, those, um, those requirements. But in terms of, you know, the accessible route, the number of parking spaces, they're providing all what, you know, what, what is required. So there isn't any, any, you know, anything that's illegal or against uh, state law. Okay. Thank you. Chris, I'll assume, Chris Brestrip, that's a legacy hand. Sorry, yes, it is. So I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, that I'll, I'll say quickly that, you know, what Chris Chamberlain had said that in the Newport parking lot that they were providing two handicapped parking spaces. So that's, you know, in according to our bylaw, we have, a, you know, the zoning bylaw has a little um, stricter requirements than the AAB, uh, Mass Architectural Access Board. So the two parking spaces required or that are provided in the Newport parking lot meets you know, our bylaw standards and the AAB standards. So those two spaces are required in the Newport uh, lot, but they don't necessarily have to be adjacent to the Lyceum building. All right, thanks, Nate. Um, I guess I'll, why don't we, I'll propose, I'll move that we add that uh, condition, Chris, as you articulated it, that they investigate the possibility of a, of a second space space and uh, return to us with the, their findings. Um, Tom? I'll second. Okay. Um, Chris Chamberlain, do you want to comment? Yeah, I, I just want to be clear because there was talk about tying the building permit to that condition, which I think would be very problematic for the project. You want to tie yeah, the that certificate is, that of the occupancy. study need to be done before a building permit is issued. How about before a certificate of occupancy is issued? I, that that's certainly fine with us, I believe. Okay. All right, uh, Johanna, you you're muted. Sorry, thank you, um, Doug. You have a motion on the table right now, right? I think so. I I could use a second. I think I seconded it. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, Tom. All right, so why don't we run through uh, any more converse conversation on my motion before we quickly vote on that? Uh, Johanna. Um, I mean, I think, I don't know that it does much harm for Amherst College to investigate it, but my guess is they've already kind of looked at it and decided they're already going above and beyond and it's not going to get used most of the time. And so, you know, happy to have the vote, but it feels a little bit, I don't know, like they're going to investigate it and they're going to decide, no, we like what we did, what we're originally proposing better for all the reasons that they've said tonight. So, you know, my inclination is not to send them on a wild goose chase and just accept that they're above the standard and it complies with the law and this is their proposal. But okay. those are my thoughts. All right. All right. Uh, anybody else want to comment or why don't I just run through our roll call here? Uh, Maria? No. All right. Uh, Jack? Uh, I have to admit, I'm utterly confused. I think I might just <laughs> have to recuse myself because weather, I'm all weather. twisted up. And I mean, for me, it's like Amherst College does so much, uh, you know, independent of, of us. And it's it's odd that this isn't, the, you know, the educational district. Um, so, and anyway, I, I just well, feel like we've been deliberating excessively um, on the project. Um, so I'm going to abstain. OK. Tom? Hi. Uh, Andrew? Hi. Uh, Janet? Hi. Johanna? No. All right, I guess I will vote aye. So that's four in favor, two opposed, and one abstaining. So. Chris, we'll add that condition. All right. Um, I'm going to tackle the findings now. Yeah, let's go ahead to the findings. OK. 
Okay, um, Pam, can you find the findings <laughs> and put them on the screen? Bear with me. Let's see. I don't want these. Okay, are you looking at them? Yes, thank you. Perfect. So these are the findings for the Lyceum project. Um, the board found under section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw site plan review as follows. 11.2400, the project is in conformance with all appropriate provisions of the zoning bylaw. The applicant has applied for a special permit to modify the front setback requirement under footnote A of table three. 11.2401, Town amenities and abutting properties will be protected through minimizing detrimental or offensive actions. The proposed academic use of the property as a location for the Center for Humanistic Inquiry and the History Department is unlikely to create detrimental or offensive actions and is expected to be a relatively quiet and unobtrusive use. Exterior lighting will be downcast and will not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. 11.2402. Abutting properties will be protected from detrimental site characteristics resulting from the proposed use. Lights will be downcast and or shielded. 11.2403, provision of adequate recreational facilities, open space and amenities has been addressed because the property is part of the Amherst College campus where such amenities are readily available to the Amherst College community. 11.2410, Unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features will be protected. The demolition of portions of the historic existing residential building has been reviewed and approved by the Historical Commission. The demolition of the historic house at 205 South Pleasant Street was approved and the house was relocated to Baker Street. 11.2411, the project provides adequate methods of refuse disposal as described in the management plan and on the site plans. 11.2412, the project will be connected to town sewer and water. The town engineer has reviewed the proposed plans and has issued a letter of comment dated December 16th, 2021. A condition of the site plan review approval will require that the project comply with the town engineer's comments and recommendations outlined in his letter. 11.2413, the proposed drainage system within and adjacent to the site will be adequate to handle the stormwater. The town engineer has reviewed the project and has issued a letter with comments dated December 16th, 2021. A condition of the site plan review approval will require that the project comply with the town engineer's comments and recommendations. I should have put in that he didn't have any comments about stormwater. So I will add that. Um, okay. 11.2414, the provision of adequate landscaping has been addressed. The project includes new plantings on site, as well as proposed new plantings in the town right of way. 11.2415, the soil erosion control methods are considered adequate to control soil erosion, both during and after construction. The town engineer has reviewed the plans and has not expressed concerns about soil erosion. 11.2416, Adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusion, intrusion of various nuisances. A construction logistics plan is required to be submitted prior to the issuance of a building permit. Um, they did already include a construction logistics plan, but I'm not sure how closely the building commissioner has looked at that yet. 11.2417, adjacent properties will be protected from the intrusion of lighting because a condition of the permit requires that exterior lighting be downcast and or shielded and not shine onto adjacent properties. 11.2418 is not applicable because the project is not located in a flood prone conservancy district. 11.2419 is not applicable. There are no wetlands on or within 100 feet of the property. 11.2420 is not applicable because although the property is in a residential zoning district, it is not within the boundaries of a National Historic Register district, and it therefore can be struck. 11.2421, um, 
the development is reasonably consistent with respect to setbacks, placement of parking, landscaping and entrances and exits with surrounding buildings and development. The applicant has applied for a special permit to modify the front setback to make it consistent with the existing building to which it will be attached. A plan has been submitted to the planning board showing the front setbacks of other buildings along South Pleasant Street in the vicinity of the proposed project, showing that the proposed setback is compatible with the setbacks of the surrounding properties. That semicolon should turn into a comma. Um, 11.2422. Building Chris, can, site. Can, can I interrupt you here? Is is this section that you just read about the special permit? Is that a place where we could put more reasons that would support the special permit, or would that come later? Um, that would come in the findings for the special permit. Okay, get so it. We can put those there. Yep. Okay. Um, Eleven point two four two two. Building sites shall avoid to the extent feasible. The impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, and wetlands. There are no steep slopes or floodplains on the site. There are no severe grade changes proposed. There are no wetlands on or near the property. Scenic views within the property consist of views to other Amherst College buildings or to Amherst College properties across the street, which will not be affected by the proposed project. 11.2423 is not applicable. There's only one building on the site since the new structure will be added to the existing building. 11.2424, screening has been provided as appropriate. All trash and maintenance equipment will be stored within an enclosed area. 11.2430, the site has been designed to provide for the convenience and safety of vehicular circulation and pedestrian movement both within the site and in relation to adjoining ways and properties. Vehicular access to the site will be from Woodside Avenue. New pedestrian walkways are proposed to connect with the parking lot at Newport House and the main campus of Amherst College. 11.2431, the location and number of curb cuts will be such as to minimize turning movements and hazardous exits and entrances. There will be only one curb cut from Woodside Avenue. 11.2432, the location and design of parking spaces, bicycle racks, drive aisles, loading areas, and sidewalks will be provided in a safe and convenient manner. There will only be one parking space on site. Well, that may change. Um, so maybe I should strike that. Um, parking, the parking space will be ac accessed via Woodside Avenue. Walking paths will connect the new building with parking spaces at Newport House and with the main campus of Amherst College. Bike racks are located to the west of the Lyceum at the end of the driveway, and the loading area is located to the west of the Lyceum. 11.2433, provision for access to adjoining properties is provided via a driveway through the property that houses the Cadogan Center for Religious Studies and via a walking path to the Newport House parking lot. 11.2434 is not applicable. The property is located in a residential district, not in a commercial or business district. 11.2435, not applicable. Joint access driveways between adjoining properties is not an issue. 11.2436, the requirement for submittal of a traffic impact statement is requested to be waived. There's no significant traffic expected to enter the site. And 11.2437 is not applicable no traffic impact report will be required. Is that okay? Right. Janet has her uh, hand up. Yes, Janet. So Chris, I have an ad um, to, um, let's see, um, oh, I lost track of it now. Um, 11.2403 about the recreational facilities because I, I, I would add in the garden that they've provided and even the seating and steps out front, because those are really lovely additions to the site and they'll be used by students. Okay. So that I just thought. Okay, thank you. All sure. right, would this, would this be a good time to uh, have the board adopt the conditions and findings for this particular site plan review? Um, I think what you would, want to do is close the public hearing on this um, project yep. 
and um, approve the what is being proposed with the conditions and findings as we just went through them. Right. And also that you approve the waivers. So this is site plan review 2022-08. Uh, Tom. I was going to move to close the public hearing on the Amherst College Lyceum project. Okay. This is, the, this, the is the site, this is the site plan review, right? Oh, sorry. We, yeah, we, have, we have three hearings that are open at the moment. Two I'm are on Lyceum, the right. Lyceum and one, you know, site and plan one review. is on the other property. So I say that again, Tom. Yeah, I don't have the, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the document and the document just says the Lyceum project. So I don't have the actual pro, uh, number. It's 2022-08. Yeah, that's- Site plan review. So yeah. that's, so he, Tom's moving that we close the public hearing for, the, for, the, for S, site plan review 2022-08. Yes. Uh, and I did I hear you right that we were you were moving that we adopt the findings and conditions Correct. as modified with the minor changes that Chris noticed as she read it and that there were several waivers of submittals like the traffic study and such that would need to be waived under that site plan review. So moved. And that you approve the project? So moved. Sure. Uh, Jack? Second. All right. Thank you both. Uh, any more conversation on this, on the site plan review here for the Lyceum? I don't see any. All right. Um, all right. We'll do a roll call. Maria? Approved. Jack? Aye. Tom? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Janet? Aye. And Johanna? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. That's unanimous. So that's 2022-08. All right. And okay. we'll go through the special permit um, findings and conditions. Okay. So this is um, special permit SPP 2022-03. Request a special permit under Article 6, Section 6, and Table 3, Footnote A of the Zoning Bylaw to modify the front setback requirement for the new academic building to be known as the Al Aliki Parati and Seth Frank Lyceum. Um, and so I, I sent you this uh, in email today. And the first two paragraphs are really just for your reference. So you can see what uh, footnote A says. And also um, footnote A refers to section 10.395 of the uh, zoning bylaw. So I put that in there too. But the findings start where it says findings under footnote A. So if Pam could scroll down, that would be helpful. Great, thank you. Oh, and by the way, I felt that there weren't any conditions related to this special permit. You had all your conditions in the um, for the site plan review, but I didn't think that there were any conditions related to the special permit. Perhaps there are, but I wasn't aware of any. So anyway, okay, findings under footnote A. Um, number one is the front setback requirement is 15 feet in the RG zoning district. Number two, for educational and religious structures, Article 6, Section 6.60 of the zoning bylaw requires that all structures approved after January 1st, 1994 by a permit granting authority for educational or religious uses shall have a minimum front side and rear setback twice the distance shown in table three for that zoning district, except in the BG districts where 
setbacks in Table 3 shall apply. Number three, therefore, Section 6.60 would typically require that the front setback of 15 feet be doubled to 30 feet for an educational structure. Number four, the Lyceum will be an educational structure and therefore the required set front setback is 30 feet. Number five, the applicant has requested that the front setback for the Lyceum be modified to allow the building to be built with a front setback of 20.4 feet to match the front setback of the existing brick building. Number six, the front setback of the existing brick building on site is 20 feet. And number seven, other existing buildings in the vicinity of the site have front setbacks as follows. And then I listed the ones that Nate had shown in his um, plan. And number eight, um, therefore the planning board finds that the proposal to modify the front setback from 30 feet to 24.4 feet does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain and to the use scale and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity with have func which have functional or visual relationship thereto. Now that was taken from um, the first sentence of section 10.395 which was something that you needed to refer to in order to approve um, a footnote A modification. So. All right, thanks, Chris. Any conversation from the board? Any modifications to these findings that you wanna make? Seeing at least one head shaking and seeing no hands. All right. Um, all right, so this is, Site special permit application 2022-03. I need a motion to close the hearing uh, and uh, approve the special permit for the uh, deviation from the setback. Andrew. So moved. Uh, Jack. You are muted. Sorry about that. Uh, before I second, I was wondering if there's any public comment on this particular hearing. All right. Uh, do any of the public wish to comment on this? Don't see any hands, Jack. So do you also want to include um, that you're approving the findings? Yes. And the, yeah. Jack. So yeah, so I second uh, with that with that amendment. So close the hearing, approve the request for the waiver, and adopt the findings. Is that right, Chris? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's uh, do a roll call. Johanna. Aye. Janet. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Tom. Aye. Jack. Aye. Maria. Approved. And I will approve as well. It's unanimous. All right. So, so two down, one to go. This Chris, shouldn't take have, as long. This doesn't have as many conditions. Conditions and findings for the uh, the Newport House property. Yep, and that is, um, let's yeah, see, get, so, uh, site plan get, review 2022-09. Yep. So if Pam can bring up the conditions, that'd be great. Yep. So number one, um, the development shall be built substantially in accordance with plans submitted to the planning board and approved on X date. Number two, development shall be managed substantially in accordance with management plans submitted to the planning board and approved on X date. Chris, can, can I say these look remarkably like the earlier conditions? They do, there are fewer of them. Okay. Number three, changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plans or to the exterior of the building shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change and or to determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the special permit or site plan review approval. Um, number four, landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscape plan. 
prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy. In this case, there wouldn't be a certificate of occupancy. So I'm not sure. I guess we just leave that out. And there's a very little bit of landscaping here anyway. And once installed shall be continually maintained. All disturbed areas shall be loamed and seeded unless otherwise specified. Number five, this site plan review approval shall expire within two years of the date that it is filed with the town clerk, unless it has been both recorded at the registry of deeds and substantial construction or use has commenced within the two year time period. Number six, construction shall be completed within 24 months from the date of the issuance of the building permit. If more time is needed, the applicant shall come before the planning board at a public meeting for review and approval of an extension of time. Number seven, the town engineer and building commissioner shall inspect the construction of the entry driveway and all on-site paved areas for conformance to town standards. Number eight, all on-site utilities shall be underground. Number nine, all exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant. Exterior lighting shall be downcast and shielded and shall not shine onto adjacent properties. The rest of these things I think are mostly related to construction, except we have that um, one item about uh, number 17 is the site fence and whether you want it to, whether you want signage to come back to you and you decided on the other project that you didn't. So I assume that would be the case here as well. Um, I would agree with that. Okay. Any objections from others? No. I don't think you need to review the other items. And number 21 is a duplicate of okay. number seven. So. All right, so we could have a, so there are no conditions that we've imposed at least. These are the conditions. I'm sorry, uh, there are no findings then. So um, the only findings I would recommend are that the uh, you find that the, um, the proposal for Newport House parking lot um, meets the relevant findings of uh, section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw. Okay, okay. that's kind of a right. blanket that you use. Often. Nate? Sure, uh, one, you know, one possible condition too would be that the, the dumpster location is being moved. So it's uh, further east of the house of Newport House and that, you know, it'd be screened from view from Northampton Road. So it wasn't clear uh, in the plans if, you know, how visible the dumpster would be and if there was any plantings around it or an enclosure that would be screening it. Uh, Chris, do you want to comment on that? Chris Chamberlain? Sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it is, uh, it does become slightly more visible in the new location. Um, it's set quite a ways back from the road and there is some existing vegetation screening it. Uh, we are more than happy to add a few more shrubs to screen it if, if appropriate. Okay, thank you. Janet? I'm wondering how to handle the waiver, the parking waiver. There's, do we need language in here saying what we're waiving and why? Or that there's a waiver? I don't Chris? think there is a waiver. This, they've, they've told us that this parking lot is not um, directly associated with Newport House or not, not Newport House with the Lyceum. So they're improving this parking lot, they're adding spaces, but I don't feel like we can really um, determine the number of spaces that would be so required way because it's an overall um, calculation based on, you know, the, the campus in general, but if, did you, did Janet have some particular language that she thought would be helpful here? You know, I think I might've missed the boat because um, on the Lyceum, because the Lyceum is the one that's supposed to have 45 spaces. And um, even though I understand that the, the theory of the campus-wide idea, but they are, it is in the RG. And so that is the requirement, which, you know, we could wave, but I think we just failed to wave it at the right time. Does that make sense? I, for some reason, I thought that would come here, but now that I think it through, what you're saying makes sense. Chris or Nate, do you have a? Do we, we should we have done a waiver previously? 
I don't think a waiver is really necessary. I think every time we review an Amherst College project, they state that they have an overall campus parking plan and the planning board approves that. If you wanted to put some language in that said that, you know, you waive the parking requirement for the Lyceum in, in, in yeah. this, you know. I don't it, think it makes it sense here. doesn't connect. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have brought that up earlier then because I know that I know that this should you know we want this to be an ED, but it's not. So I think I missed I missed that vote. Chris Chamberlain. Yeah, I mean, I would just suggest that by that by approving the site plan with conditions, um, you know that that was approved with the parking as shown. Um, I just I know working in many other towns that rarely do they tick off each and every waiver. If that is helpful. All right, thank you. Next time then. All right. So, um, all right. So we need, unless there are other comments, we need a motion to close the hearing for site plan review 2022 09. Um, accept these conditions as modified while Chris was reading them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and approve the site plan review application. Do you want to add a condition about screening the dumpster? How do folks you... feel how do folks feel about that? I mean it does seem fairly far back from the road. Andrew? I was just gonna say uh, Chris suggested he wouldn't have a problem with it. I think if he doesn't have a problem with it, let's let's go ahead and put it in. Okay. Okay. Uh, any anybody want to nod their head or uh, shake their head? Jack. Uh, I, I'd second what Andrew. All right. Suggested. All right, I'll take that as enough of an indication that we will add it unless somebody objects now. All right, Chris, you have that? Yep. All right, does anybody want to give me a, make a motion? All right, then, all right, Andrew? Um, I will make the motion, I, I well, don't. So we'll yeah. close, close the hearing, accept the findings, as modified in the discussion and approve the site plan review application. Except the conditions. So there are conditions. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep and then the finding the was that this um, Newport House parking lot meets the relevant uh, criteria of 11.24. All right. I would say that, or Doug, since you said half of it, you could do it and I'll second it. But all right. Either way. I'll let you, you, you made the motion and Jack, are you gonna second it? Uh, yes, and pr in pretty much so moved uh, from what Chris has said. So I think that's what Andrew is saying as well. Yep, we have, Jack, you seconded it. Yes. All right, so we'll vote. Uh, I don't see any hands raised at all. Uh, Maria? Ruth. Jack? Aye. Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And I'm an I, unanimous. All right, so we have closed all of our public hearings. The time is 1018. And I think we can go to old business. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank thank you all from Amherst Thanks. College. I hope I hope this lets you get on your way. Thank you. All right. Oh, oh the next item we had on our agenda was uh, more discussion about the solar bylaw. Uh, unless anybody objects, I think we should postpone that to the next meeting. Janet. I'm not objecting, but I was a little confused about this agenda item and what we should be doing to prepare for it or what 
what we'd be working on. So I did okay. read a whole pack of bylaws, but I just wanted to know, like, what are we doing? Well, at least the way it's written here, um, you know, we were going to be generally continuing our discussion, but we were going to be talking about some of what we saw in some of the examples from other communities and from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission uh, in their in their models or their adopted bylaw. Um, and so I think we received a lot of those for the last meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you ha still have that packet available, you probably ought to read, look through some of those things. Um, Chris. So um, just to let everybody know, the CRC will be taking up the moratorium on um, next Thursday at their meeting, which I think is the 26th of January. Is that right? 27th of January, 27th of January, yeah. So they're having a meeting in the evening to talk about that. We've had a lot of internal discussions about the solar bylaw and we're um, moving ahead with thinking about that and working with Stephanie Ciccarello and trying to get um, the solar study off the ground. And um, so there's there's movement here in town hall, but we, we haven't presented anything on that to you yet. Um, and then Doug asked me under item D, 4D, to give you an update on um, zoning priorities. And I'd be happy to do that at the next meeting. If I did it tonight, it would probably take a while. So I think it's probably better to postpone that till the next meeting, but um, hopefully I'll be able to write something up before the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. And as a part of that, I was hoping you would give us the status of all the zoning initiatives that we talked about last year, just so we can all be clear about what passed and what was adopted and yeah. what is yet, what didn't get mm -hmm. completed. All right, so we'll move on. Uh, the time is now 1021 and old business. Do we have any old business, Chris? No old business, nope. All right, uh, new business, any new business? No new Not business. Not anticipated? Nope. All right, form A, A and R's? Nope. Mm -hmm. Nope. Uh, upcoming ZBA applications, any changes? Nothing new. All right. Upcoming special permit, site plan review, subdivision applications? Yes, we just had a site plan review submitted, excuse me, um, for um, Ron Laverdier's property down on West Street. And he's reconfiguring uh, access to one of his buildings and um, the little planting area there. So we'll bring, be bringing that to you in the next um, month or so. Okay. All right. Uh, item 10, Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports. Um, Jack, anything you want to say about PBPC? I have no news, but I did have a conversation with Chris with regard to the um, uh, technical assistance funding and, and using Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's expertise with regard to that zoning bylaw, or excuse me, solar um, bylaw. So we're ha we have a meeting later on uh, this week, I think maybe Friday, to talk about the DLTA um, application, the District Local Technical Assistance application. Mm -hmm. So we have a number of different ideas about how we could manage that or take advantage of that. And uh, solar bylaw is one of the things. Okay. Uh, Other than that, nothing. Okay. Yeah. Andrew, CPAC? Um, no significant updates. Um, our report was finalized, I think, on Friday. Um, we may hear from the high school. Uh, so they provided, uh, the, or they submitted an application, which they then rescinded and indicated they might come back. If they do, we'll, we'll get the band back together. But um, right now it's quiet. Okay, thank you. Tom, DRB? No news. All right, and Chris, anything else you want to say about CRC? Nothing else, no. All right, I have no, no remarks this evening as chair. Any report of staff, Chris? I'd just like to say that this year is starting off with a bang. 
I was expecting to have a month of kind of quietness, but it seems like that's not uh, to be true. So anyway, fasten your seatbelts. All right. Well, let's try not to make let not make our ten thirty adjournment uh, regular thing this year. All right. So the time is ten twenty four, and unless anybody has anything else to say, we will adjourn. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Thank all you. for your time. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good, night. Good morning. Good job, Doug. <laughs>